prayer. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to our King, to his government, to members of the Legislative Assembly, and to all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your Spirit. May they never lead the province wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideas, but laying aside all private interest and prejudice, keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all. Please be seated. Introduction of visitors. The Honourable the Minister of Culture has a visitor today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to introduce to you and through you to all members of this House. Uh, special guest, Honourable Laura Ross, Minister of Parks, Culture and Sports, and the Minister also responsible for status women for the Government of Saskatchewan, who sits at your gallery, Mr. Speaker. I had the privilege of working with the Honourable uh, Minister Ross and other ministers across the whole province, recent, uh, whole country, recently uh, endorsed the National Action Plan to end gender-based violence. Earlier today, we discussed further actions that uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta can jointly take to advance women's success in our respective provinces. Mr. Speaker, please extend our warm welcome to our special guest, Mr. Ross. <laughs> Honourable members, uh, some of you have expressed some concern around the timing of introduction for visitors or guests. Those are two separate categories inside our routine. As such, the rules are different. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs has a guest. Mr. Speaker, it is my incredible pleasure to introduce to you and through you to all members of the Assembly two incredible grade six classes from Baturn. There's over 70 guests here joining us today with their teachers and some grown-ups that are here to support them. I please ask that they rise and receive the traditional warm welcome of this assembly. The Honourable the Chief Government Whip has visitors, guests. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am very excited to introduce East Elementary School from Leduc uh, and the class here today uh, from grades four to six and their teachers as well. Welcome to the assembly. Uh, can we all rise, please, and receive the warm welcome of the assembly? The Honourable Member for Vermilion, Lloydminster Wainwright. Introduced to you and through you. Uh, my colleagues from the Premier's Council on the status of persons with disabilities. Mm. We have Council Chair Dominic Shaw, Vice Chair Shino Nakani, and members Earl Thiessen and Katie Savanto. Please identify yourselves in the gallery and accept the warm welcome of the Legislature. Does the Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs have another visitor or a guest? Uh, are there other guests? The Honourable Member for Airdrie East has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise and introduce to and through you and all members of this Assembly, two of my constituents from the great riding of Airdrie East, uh, Mr. Lucas Daly and Mr. Jason Schuler. Please rise and to receive the traditional warm welcome of this Assembly. Are there other guests? Seeing none, the clerk. Ministerial statements. Member's statements. The member for Athabasca, Barhead, Westlock has a statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Due to the strong economic policies implemented by Alberta's government, our economy is rapidly evolving and diversifying beyond our core industries of agriculture, energy and forestry. New industries and opportunities are emerging, and rural Alberta <clears throat> deserves a strong plan for economic development that reflects the needs of the people who live and work there. Over the past year, the Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation hosted 23 engagement sessions with over 370 rural stakeholders. Using the feedback we received from these engagements, the Minister built the Economic Development in Rural Alberta Plan. Several themes were brought up that will guide the plan's strategic actions, including critical infrastructure, red tape reduction, workforce strategies, rural investment attraction, tourism and business supports. Rural Alberta represents 18% of our population, while accounting for 41% of Alberta's private and public investment. 
The significant impact of rural communities in our province means that getting it right is essential and that is only possible by recognizing the importance of grassroots inclusion in the policy making process. Telecommunication networks are vital to attracting rural investment and strategic direction number one in the plan will ensure all of Alberta has broadband service availability by 2026. Ending the digital divide and enabling rural businesses to compete in an interconnected global economy. The plan will establish new targets for the Alberta Agri-Food Investment and Growth Strategy and the plan also encourages continued collaboration with our partners in the nine regional economic development alliances. Each RIDA will receive an investment of $125,000 from the Alberta government in the new year. Our United Conservative Government represents nearly every rural community in Alberta and we will continue ensuring they have the tools and resources to compete and succeed. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Beverly, Clareview. Mr. Speaker, just last hour, the Leader of the Official Opposition and soon-to-be Premier of Alberta unveiled our new Competitiveness, Jobs and Investment Strategy. It's a broad-ranging plan that will create 47,000 new jobs and attract $20 billion in new investment. It includes the introduction of a new Alberta's future tax credit, which will position our great province as a destination of choice for new and emerging sectors like critical minerals and advanced manufacturing, and strengthen existing sectors like agriculture, forestry, life sciences, and tourism. We're also introducing a regulatory fast pass, a nexus-type pass for business that will ensure our upstanding Alberta companies can get their projects approved faster. We're also supercharging the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program, which our government launched and the current government kept because it's working so well. We'll expand to new areas with this program, including eligible feedstock, new end products, and we'll bring back partial upgrading. We'll also consult broadly with our Indigenous partners on expanding the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, something we think this government actually got right. But the key is consultation with First Nations, and we take that responsibility seriously. Oh, and for the record, there will absolutely be an Alberta Investor Tax Credit, a Digital Media Tax Credit, with an NDP government in place. Additionally, we'll introduce an Alberta Venture Fund, which gives Albertans the opportunity to invest in companies in their own backyard, giving Alberta startups and scale-ups a shot in the arm. Mr. Speaker, these measures are just part of the economic plan we're building at albertasfuture.ca. We're putting rural broadband in every community, expanding affordable childcare, supporting post-secondary and putting a new campus in downtown Calgary. Our post-secondary institutions are major economic drivers that will grow the talent pipeline to help address labour shortages. We're unlocking our potential in hydrogen, geothermal, bitumen beyond combustion, and supercharging Alberta's rural economies. Mr. Speaker, Alberta's NDP opposition is excited for 2023 when we'll implement this plan. Yeah. 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 Mr. Strathmore has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It has been an honour to serve you in this House as a minister, a private member, and as an opposition member. And I'd like to share some of the many accomplishments in the riding of Chester Strathmore and Rocky View, and to thank the partners, colleagues, and friends who have worked so hard to see these projects through. In March, the Wheatland County Food Bank was awarded $300,000, and in May, the Carsland Fire Hall celebrated their grand opening. Changes were made to improve local EMS services, adding paramedic staff and expanding 24-hour service in Chestermere, and adding core flex shifts in Wheatland County to avoid burnout. And multiple grant play grant, uh, playground grants plus stabilization grants during COVID-19 for nonprofits and community organizations. We modernized into school, originally built in 1952. Carsland expanded their school and developed Speargrass Park. Chestermere Recreation fixed their roof and Springbank Recreation upgraded their facility. Bears Paw Lions Club enhanced their facility. And a new emergency services building school and baseball diamonds, all in the hamlet of Langdon. We attracted new businesses, creating thousands of jobs with state-of-the-art facilities such as Phyto Organics in Strathmore and Canadian Gypsum in de Havilland in Wheatland County. We expanded broadband, and the Canadian Infrastructure Bank made a historical $850 million joint investment with us by increasing irrigation lands to southern Alberta by more than 200,000 acres. And this is small by comparison to the thousands of hours spent by folks building our communities, a direct result of the tenacious advocacy and passion in the writings that I represented. It has truly been the greatest honour of my life to represent you and work on behalf of the people of Alberta. A huge thank you to our constituency staff who are on the front lines, and thank you to all of the ministers 
and ministries and colleagues of the past eight years. Jacinda Arden, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, New Zealand said, I really rebel against the idea that politics has to be a place full of ego, where we are constantly focused on scoring points against each other. Yes, we need a robust democracy, but you can be strong and you can be kind. Thank you to all of you. The Honourable Member for Fort Saskatchewan, Beggarville is next. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Things are really looking up in my constituency of Fort Saskatchewan, Beggarville. Over the past couple of years, my constituency has seen billions of dollars worth of investment, creating good paying jobs and sustaining our communities. We have some of Alberta's largest and highest profile investments over the past few years. Investments like Dow Chemicals, $10 billion net zero polyethylene and ethylene derivatives facility. Dow also plans a $298 million expansion to its existing ethylene plant. My constituency is home to projects like Suncor and Adco's joint venture to build a hydrogen product production facility. And there is also Shell Canada's Quest carbon capture and storage facility, which has already captured and stored 6 million tons of carbon dioxide, as well as the Enel Green Power Grizzly Bear Creek wind farm, which will be able to power over 73,000 households and the ADCO Future Fuel Renewable Natural Gas Facility that will produce gas to heat the county of Two Hills. And of course, Air Products, $1.6 billion blue hydrogen complex, will make Alberta a world leader in hydrogen. INCA is investing $72 million in a hemp processing facility in Vagerville, making good use of a $400,000 grant from the Government of Alberta. We also partner to invest in Vagerville's Agri-Food Industrial Park project. I am pleased that Rocky Mountain Hemp has also made my constituency their home. Alberta's economy is on a roll. We lead the country in job creation and our economy is rapidly diversifying into new and emerging sectors. We also continue to lead the world in Alberta's traditional sectors of energy and agriculture. This year we have led the country in Q2 interprovincial migration. I know that my constituencies, constituents are recognized in the low tax pro-growth policies of our government. They can see clearly the record investment in Fort Saskatchewan and Vagerville, and we have just begun. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Whitehunt has a statement. Alberta is fortunate to have a large and vibrant Chinese community, especially in my riding of Edmonton White Mud. Chinese immigrants came to Canada over a century ago to help build the Canadian Pacific Railway, which is critical to the, the development of Western Canada. However, these Chinese immigrants were exploited. They were not paid fairly, and they suffered under terrible working conditions. These workers and their families deserve our immense gratitude and our apologies for their treatment. Today, Chinese Albertans are many things, including engineers, physicians, entrepreneurs, frontline healthcare workers, service, service industry workers, and so much more. Chinese Canadians have helped build the Alberta we know today and play a key role in shaping Alberta's social, economic, and cultural landscape. In my conversations with members of the Chinese community, they shared with me their vision for a strong, prosperous, and inclusive Alberta. They're worried about the fragile state of our health care system. Students are feeling burdened with increasing tuition costs, all while worrying about cuts to seniors' benefits for their grandparents. Anti-Asian hate, unfortunately, has been on the rise since the pandemic. Surveys indicate that we each have Chinese neighbours, friends, and colleagues who do not feel safe and like they belong. As leaders, this is a problem that we must address. It's why the Alberta NDP's anti-racism proposal on albertasfuture.ca includes strengthening hate crime legislation, developing an anti-racism curriculum that teaches about Chinese Albertans, collecting race-based data, and reducing barriers to access support programs. Pandemic-related increases in business closures, community disorder, and anti-Asian racism have also harmed the historic communities of Chinatown in Edmonton and Calgary. Government must provide funding and support for Chinatown revitalization. Chinese Albertans want to feel safe. They care about their families. They care about quality health care. They worry about having a strong education and post-secondary system. And of course, they want a stable economy. I'm looking forward to our continued engagement with Chinese Albertans as we work together to build a better future. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Calgary Fish Creek. Mr. Speaker, with my history of working in residential construction, it's perhaps no surprise that I consider housing is a vital pillar of the Alberta Advantage. Housing ranks as the second largest expense off the paychecks of most Albertans, with 30% of, of the income being a benchmark for affordability, affordability. We speak often of the importance of affordable housing and the protection of our most vulnerable, and I am grateful for the recent allocation of $55 million by our government in support of the sector. 
However, we must put a renewed focus on housing affordability writ large, with particular attention to workforce housing for low- to middle-income households, who quite frankly rarely get the hand up that they need to achieve housing stability at various stages of their lives. The challenges we face in a growing economy range from ensuring a steady, predictable and balanced land supply to the ever-escalating burden on renters and buyers of a multitude of multi uh, municipal and other jurisdictional fees, taxes and levies, which always, and I repeat, always get passed on to the tenant or owner. Mr. Th Speaker, through a deeper understanding of the housing continuum, it is now time for us to focus not only on housing affordability, but choice and suitability in meeting the needs of Albertans, but also to consider we can move towards empowering all Albertans to aspire to a dream home at each stage of life, whether that be uh, the comfort of a safe, warm and welcoming roof over their heads, the first studio or one-bedroom apartment, urban or suburban condo or townhome, or that single-family home with a swing set in the backyard not to mention the perfect downsizer for the retiring Albertan looking to free up equity to uh, live a better active age or life. The choices of housing tenure from social or subsidized rental, near or near market rental, rent to own or shared equity, through to attainable assisted or market ownership, or even the demographic shift for many retirees moving back through the continuum, it is now time for a deliberate drive towards more innovative housing models with nimble and comprehensive plans to protect our people, our economy, and to nurture the dreams and ambitions of Albertans for generations to come. Yeah. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary Hayes. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The UCP have been cleaning up the mess the NDP made during their time in government. I'm not sure the NDP leader even likes Albertans, as she has called us embarrassing cousins. Those her party disagrees with, they call sewer rats. Her solution to high energy costs, which he, she herself caused with the carbon tax, is to, quote, take the bus. I'm sure that goes over big where no bus service exists. The NDP showed a lack of support for parental choice in education and want extremist groups like Extinction Rebellion in the classroom. Their disastrous health policies drove up wait times and created backlogs for surgeries, putting our system in a constant state of disarray even before a pandemic. Rather than supporting treatment for people afflicted with addiction, they choose supervised injection sites as the main course of action. They even defended the misuse of funds at one location. Under the NDP, these sites were clustered together in areas where a particular group had to people had to deal with all of the crime and disorder unfairly. The NDP leader constantly sided with the Trudeau government with his hostility towards Alberta. She helped Trudeau cancel the Northern Gateway and Energy East pipelines and did not support the Keystone XL. Now they expect Albertans to believe they are for the economy after driving out 180,000 jobs and over $100 billion in investment. A former NDP minister once told Albertans to go, to go to BC and find work. Mr. Speaker, our UCP government has attracted the largest investments Alberta has ever seen. We are putting more money into both health care and education than at any other time in Alberta history. Our recovery program for addiction is becoming famous for its success in helping those suffering from addiction. We are seeing massive level, levels of economic diversification, including financial services, high-tech, film, television, hydrogen, agriculture, irrigation, and more. The st contract is stark, Mr. Speaker. In May, Albertans can choose to go back to the dark days of the NDP or choose to support an NDP government building a better economy, health care, and quality of life. Reports by standing in special committees. Presenting petitions. Notices of motions. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Blue Lana Call. I rise to give oral notice of Bill 206, uh, Insurance Amendment Act, Insurance Private Passenger Vehicle Premium Amendment Act 2022, and Bill will be sponsored by your truly MLA from Calgary, Buller McCall. Mm -hmm. Introduction of bills. Honourable members, the time is 1.50, and that makes it oral question period. And the honourable member for Edmonton Glenora has question one. Mr. Speaker, all Albertans need the right health care in the right place at the right time. 
But today, Albertans are waiting longer than ever. They're waiting in overwhelmed emergency rooms, sitting next to their sick children. They're waiting for an ambulance to arrive, unsure if one's even on the way. They're waiting for a family doctor to move back to Alberta because they already watched them move away once. And Bill 201 would have set standards in health care, would have included standards for shorter wait times. So instead of passing it, why did the Premier choose to leave Albertans waiting yet again? The Honourable the Premier has the call. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, th I think that the uh, members opposite are forgetting that there are multiple parts of their bill, and they put one part of their bill that would have shut down publicly funded chartered surgical centres, which are now performing 20% of all publicly funded surgeries in our provinces. If we had voted to endorse that, we actually would have reduced the capacity for our, our ability to, to cut surgical wait times rather than an increase increased it, and I have no problem supporting measures on EMS, on surgical wait times, and on operating rooms, and we're going to continue to work on that. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenora. Under this Premier, sick children are waiting for health care in a trailer outside of their hospital. Shame. Mr. Speaker, the health care system is in chaos and frontline front health care workers are exhausted. Since the UCP formed government, the number of health care workers quitting has gone up. Workers are now more than twice as likely to quit within their first year. More staff are working overtime. More staff are getting sick, and staff vacancies are through the roof. The representatives of more than 120,000 frontline health care workers asked for a meeting with the Minister of Health months ago to address this crisis. So to the Premier, since your minister refuses to meet, will you? The Honourable the Premier. Yes, I'd be happy to. I, in fact, before we announced that Dr. John Cowell was taking over as the official administrator, we made sure to have one-on-one -on -one calls with the head of the HSAA, with the head of AUPE, and with the nurses' union, so that they understood that as we were making decisions, we would need their help and support in making sure that we got it right. And if there were any issues along the way, that we could troubleshoot them so that uh, we, could, we could make course corrections as we go along. That relationship is working very well. We're going to continue to work together to make sure that we're addressing the, the frontline issues and I have asked as well for as part of our measures to make sure that we're measuring measures of workplace satisfaction here, here. Here, here. the honorable member from Glenora calling Heather Smith to tell her you're firing the board is not working with her in a meeting like she's requested to address the health care worker crisis premier yeah. the premier claims that frontline staff crisis is manufactured and that health care staffing is, uh, is, is their creation, the issue that they're facing. But the truth is much more simple, Mr. Speaker. The UCP's bad decisions and their repeated attacks on health care workers have caused chaos. Yeah. Alberta needs more health care workers, including nurses, at the front lines, and that includes Alberta-trained nurses. So to the Premier, instead of jacking up tuition on University of Calgary nursing students, 8% this year and 10% last year, will you reverse it? The Premier! Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. AHS had made a decision to, uh, to bar unvaccinated workers from being able to work in the system, which was a decision we reversed, which is a decision we reversed. When, when I mentioned that that was creating unnecessary shortages, that's what I was referring to. I'm pleased to see that everybody has been invited back into the system. That allows for us to increase capacity on the front line. That's the important part, is that we've got to create a welcoming environment for workers from around the country and around the world to come to this province, and that's what we're going to do. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Glenora, for the second set of questions. And the Premier's hiking up tuition for nursing students at the University of Calgary. Yeah. Speaking of affordability, let's talk about the UCP's plan for inflation. The package put forward by the UCP government deliberately excludes more than 2 million Albertans. That's 2 million people who are stressed, who could use some relief, but they'll not be getting a single bit of help from the UCP. Wow. Mr. Speaker, those same nursing students who are seeing their tuition go up, unless they have children, won't get a dime from the UCP. Yeah. Why isn't the UCP giving a penny to post-secondary students in need? The Honourable, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, as we have seen issues identified where we have additional pressure points, like post-secondary, like student loan costs, like tuition, I've asked our Utilities and Affordability Minister to take a closer look at it. We have only come forward with an initial package on affordability, and we intend to, de to develop more, more initiatives. And so we will certainly have a, a look at that one. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, this is just the beginning. We also have support for all Albertans right. through uh, gasoline and diesel tax rebates, through electricity rebates, and through price protection on natural gas. That's going to help everybody. Here, here, here. Paul, the member for Edmonton, Glenora. Among those 
two million, how about Rick, Mr. Speaker? Rick's in his 40s. He doesn't have kids. He doesn't drive. He works hard just to pay his rent, buy a bus pass, and put groceries on the table. He's feeling the impact of a 40-year high inflation hike, just like everyone else. So to the Premier, why isn't Rick getting a dime in Bill 2? Why did the UCP leave half of Albertans empty-handed? The Honourable the Premier has the call. You know, the members opposite were so concerned about the cost of everything going up. I don't know why they didn't call out their federal leader, That's Jagmeet right. Singh, when he signed oh, yeah. on to a 300 percent increase in the carbon tax, yeah, 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 yeah. which increases the cost of everything, in particular groceries, in particular Absolutely. the uh, price that we're paying at the, at the pump. If you increase the cost of the fuel tax, it's going to be built into everything that we're yeah. paying for. And I would think that they would have more credibility on this issue if they advocated at the federal level Level, as we have for suspension of that carbon tax, rather than asking for it to be increased threefold. That's right. The Honourable Member for Edmonton-Glenora. Order, order, order. The Honourable the Member for Edmonton-Glenora has the call. Mr. Speaker, it would be one thing if these checks were actually arriving with some urgency, but instead the UCP government is making families jump through hoops to apply. This means hundreds of thousands of Albertans logging onto a government website hoping it doesn't crash. And in the past, that hasn't worked out so well. So why do corporations get a no-jobs corporate handout of $4.7 billion, no strings attached, while families have to deal with red tape just to maybe, hopefully, a few months before the election get a little bit of relief? The Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I think we saw from the federal program for CERB that the portal access actually works very well. And we have the expertise that we're developing at the provincial level to use our provincial portals for the same thing. I'm looking forward to uh, working with the Minister of Technology and Innovation and watching what he develops with the Minister of, uh, of, of Affordability and Utilities, because that's the approach we're going to take. And as we start developing this expertise, we'll be able to apply it to more things. This is the important part of us being able to do these programs, is to be able to have the flexibility to provide the support when it's needed. Here, here, here. Member for Edmonton, Ellerslie has a question. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, the NDP government responded to the needs of Edmontonians by announcing the creation of a new South Edmonton hospital to meet the needs of a growing city. It's also clear that with our health care under so much stress that this hospital would be critical. However, despite the clear need, the UCP government has delayed this project time and time again. And even yesterday, the infrastructure minister couldn't answer simple questions about the hospital. Questions like when the project will start, how long will it take, and what will it cost? Since the infrastructure minister doesn't know, maybe the premier can answer. What year will the South Edmonton Hospital open? The Honourable the Minister of Infrastructure and the Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Happy to answer this question. Of course, the NDP, as is their want, announced a huge spending with no plan. We have gone back to do a functional development so we know what we're building. We have to know what we want to solve. We have to know what we want to treat before we can build that. Unlike the NDP, we're doing the work first to create a functional plan so we know what to build. Here, here. The order, order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Ellerslie. Every day in this House, the Premier and the Health Minister talk about how focused they are on building capacity in health care, capacity that South Edmonton Hospital would provide. Our government would have opened it by 2026. The Kenny government delayed it to 2030, and now this government has taken the start date off the website, leaving many Albertans worried that this project is about to be cancelled. Can the Premier confirm, with a yes or a no? Yeah whether the South Edmonton Hospital is still going to be built, and on what date will construction formally start? The Honourable the Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The 2022 to 2025 capital plan is providing $370 million over three years for this project. We continue to build a plan so we know what service we are providing. Without that plan, we can build a huge building, but to serve what? We need a plan first. Once we have that, we will move ahead. We will start the building, and we were committing to all Albertans and all, El all Edmontonians to do this right by planning first. Here, here. The order, order, order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Ellen 
addition to the long delays the UCP have subjected to this project, they also plan to return to the failed model of P3s to build it. We know that the P3 model doesn't make sense. In fact, that was a direct quote from former Conservative Infrastructure Minister Wayne Drysdale when he shut down the approach for building schools in 2014, since it increased costs and caused huge delays. Can the Premier tell us why her government continues to use this broken model to build schools and hospitals? Is she really going to make the same mistakes of the past and harm the health care and education provided to Albertans in the process? Call the Deputy Premier and the Minister of Infrastructure. In fact, I would ask the member opposite to do his homework. The last bundle of schools I actually took apart took him out of a P3. We're going to a direct bid-build design process. We will, however, continue to use P3s, public-private partnerships, where they're warranted, where they make business sense, where they save Albertans money, and where they will serve the needs of that project on a case-by-case -case basis best. Again, we are doing the work behind the scenes that the former government failed to do. They didn't do their homework. They didn't build a plan. They don't understand contracts. We're doing all that work for Albertans to save them money. Yeah. The order, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford is next. Yesterday, in question period, while defending her complete failure to consult with Indigenous people regarding the Sovereignty Act, the Premier ignorantly compared First Nations' struggles against oppression and their fight for their rights to her government's bloated feud with Ottawa. Quote, they have fought a battle over the last number of years to get sovereignty respected and to extract themselves from the paternalistic Indian Act. We get treated the exact same way from Ottawa, end quote. Does the Premier understand the harm her comments create when she minimizes abuse of First Nations and they have faced throughout Canada's history and they're still fighting now? The Honourable the Premier. Mr. Mr. Speaker, that was certainly not the intention of my comments. And if it was taken that way, I absolutely apologize for that. O order. The Honourable the Premier has the call. My intention was to demonstrate that the process that our First Nations have gone through to develop sovereignty over their own affairs and extract themselves from the Indian Act is the process that we are following in going through and, and asserting our rights under the Constitution. I, I take inspiration from what the First Nations have done, and I'm looking forward to continue engaging and consulting with them. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford. Indigenous people within Alberta and across the province had faced genocide through abuse in residential schools, the past system, 60 scoop, and countless community members who are murdered and missing. Indigenous people are still tirelessly fighting so that their culture, language, and existence remains. To compare her fights with Ottawa over issues like fertilizer policy is a complete failure of understanding of the atrocities Indigenous people have suffered. Simple question, will the Premier apologize for this comment? Yes. The Honourable the Premier were misconstrued, I absolutely apologize for it, because my intention was to demonstrate that we have a common problem with Ottawa. Ottawa, I think, unfortunately, to treat, treats First Nations with disrespect, and they also treat provinces with disrespect. What we need to do is to go back to the original intention of the Constitution and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and make sure that Ottawa is respecting both First Nations sovereignty rights as well as our rights under the Constitution. The Honourable the Member for Edmonton Rutherford. Just hours ago, Treaty 6 Chief stated, quote, It was clear from our discussions that Premier Smith does not understand treaty or our inherent rights, nor does she respect them. The Premier will not dictate how we will be consulted. We point her once again to the duty to consult to learn more about how to engage and work with us appropriately. To the Premier, the Sovereignty Act is another bill forced on First Nations without consultation that is attacking their sovereignty and their inherent and treaty rights. What will it take for her to listen, apologize and withdraw Bill 1? Absolutely. The Honourable the Premier. Withdrawing Bill 1, and I, I am speaking regularly with the chiefs to, um, to point them to Section 2C of the, of the Act that we put forward that expressly states that nothing in the Act is going to impact their treaty or Aboriginal rights. That's what Section 35 is all about. I respect a, the, car, the Charter, I respect the Constitution, I respect that we have a nation to nation relationship with First Nations, and I'm looking forward to identifying those areas that we can work with in partnership. Every time 
time I speak with a, a new nation, identify areas that we can work with together. I'm looking forward to doing that more. The Honourable Member Order. The Honourable Member for La Companoca. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Record levels of interpersonal, interprovincial migration, a balanced budget, skyrocketing levels of venture capital investment. It's all great news for Alberta. It means our province is a magnet for ambitious Canadians, has an optimistic future, and more minds and money to drive innovation. Every Albertan and member of our legislature should take pride in the last few years of economic reinvigoration. However, some regions of our province have yet to reach their full economic potential. To the Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation, how is Alberta's government ensuring our province's economic prosperity benefits rural communities? The Honourable the Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the question. I was happy and pleased today to be joined by the Minister of Jobs, Economy, and Northern Development uh, representation from uh, one of Alberta's regional economic development alliances and the presidents of both RMA and Alberta municipalities uh, to announce a new five-year economic development in rural Alberta plan. The plan provides a coordinated and strategic approach to support economic growth and create jobs in rural Alberta. The plan outlines clear priorities to achieve maximum benefit for rural communities as Alberta's economy grows. I think this is important to everyone in this house because when Alberta, rural Alberta thrives, all of Alberta thrives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And given that centralized planning is the worst approach to governance and fails the needs of rural businesses, indigenous communities, and small towns, given that the new two solitudes in Canada is the rural-urban divide, which means that city bureaucrats are necessarily urban biased and unconscious of those outside of their immediate circle, and given the importance of including the input of people impacted by government policies to the same minister, how were rural businesses and communities included in the drafting of the Economic Development in Rural Alberta Plan? The Honourable the Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it, it was very important to us to make sure that this uh, consultation was, was very thorough. We all saw what's happened when you don't consult rural Alberta, like in the Bill 6 circumstance. But I'd say over the last 18 months, we had 23 virtual engagement sessions with over 370 rural Albertans, businesses and communities collected over 3,500 individual comments and thoughts, had an online survey with over 1,000 responses. This included ag producers, municipalities, economic development agencies, the indigenous community, post-sex, not-for-profits. We tried to make it as thorough as possible. The member for Lacompanoka. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Minister for that good work. Uh, given the extensive level of consultation that went into ensuring economic development in rural Alberta plan addresses the concerns of small rural businesses and not urban bureaucrats, and given that Alberta's government includes a caucus cabinet and premier with deep personal understandings of life in rural communities, and given that Alberta's low taxes, budget surpluses, and educated workforce mean that our province is once again open for business, again to the Minister, what initiatives does an economic Alberta in development in rural Alberta plan support to drive investment and diversification in rural communities? The Honourable the Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The plan supports these ongoing initiatives, these important initiatives. The Investment and Growth Fund's Rural Stream, Alberta's Broadband Strategy, Travel Alberta's Rural Tourism Initiatives, the Forest Jobs Action Plan, the Alberta Indigenous Oppor Opportunities Corporation, uh, just to name a few. And also to make clear, there's five strategic directions. Economic development enabling infrastructure, rural business supports and entrepreneurship, skills development, Promotion and marketing of rural tourism and rural economic development capacity building. The Honourable the Member for Edmonton City Centre is next. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Edmonton's downtown needs help as businesses and communities struggle to recover from the impacts of COVID-19, which saw thousands of workers leave their offices here while the number of our friends and neighbours living houseless doubled and social disorder increased. Business and community leaders have stepped up to advocate. The City of Edmonton has been taking action, but for too long, they've lacked provincial support. To begin in March of this year, the government committed $5 million to help with downtown revitalization. But 10 months later, despite a $13 billion surplus, it is yet to be paid. To the Minister of Finance, when will you release the $5 million you promised? The Honourable the Minister of Finance and the President of the Treasury Board has the call. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we're working with uh, the cities of Edmonton and Calgary. We're working with all of Alberta municipalities on revitalizing our economies, both locally and right across the province. Mr. Speaker, the best thing we can do as a government 
is ensure that we have the most competitive business environment possible that will attract investment, create opportunities, and Mr. Speaker, our plan's working. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Given, Mr. Speaker, that business and community leaders in our downtown have spent years struggling to get the attention of this government, but that's been a challenge as they've been mired in their own internal drama, multiple cabinet shuffles leaving conversations and consultations on hold or forced to restarting. Given, indeed, this government is yet to even release the report from the Edmonton Metro Region Economic Recovery Working Group. And given the UCP has now simply struck yet another task force, one with no representation from our businesses or communities or any consultation with Council, why doesn't this government simply step up? and act now on recommendations already out from their own working group, City Council, the Downtown Recovery Coalition. The so Honourable the Member of Jobs, the Economy and Northern Development. Mr. Speaker, Alberta's economy is on fire. We created 25 percent, almost 25 percent of the jobs for the entire country over the last year, Mr. Speaker. But let's talk about downtowns, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk about plans. This is an NDP plan, Mr. Speaker, like all their plans. It's a plan to ask other people to come forward with a plan, Mr. Speaker. That's not a plan. We have a plan to create jobs and to create wealth for Albertans, Mr. Speaker, and that plan is working. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Given, Mr. Speaker, this government continues to rail against Ottawa, complaining of heavy-handed paternalism, a lack of consultation, a failure to understand the unique culture of their province, but given their new task force doesn't include anyone who lives or operates a business in our downtown or anyone with lived experience, instead we have a collection of newly minted Calgary ministers, two suburban councillors who don't actually represent council, and a handful of bureaucrats. And given that the Municipal Affairs Minister claims she wants to work with all stakeholders on this, will this government recognize its own hypocrisy? and add someone who actually lives in and loves this community. The Honourable the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the question. Mr. Speaker, we have brought together key cabinet ministers, emergency responders, first responders, city officials, indigenous leaders, and health system experts to quickly implement over $63 million worth of initiatives in Edmonton. Our task force does include two Edmonton City Councillors. We have also order, invited... Order, order, order. The Honourable the Ministers. We have also invited the City Manager as well as the Edmonton Fire Chief, and we hope that they will be allowed to come. I would ask that, that Mayor Sohi and the rest of the, in, of the individuals on that side of the House stop playing politics and get to work with the rest of us. recent Canada Mental Health Association report from October found that Albertans, more than those in any other province, are feeling stressed, angry, lonely and depressed. We know that the pandemic has had a massive impact on the health of Albertans, which is why our caucus has proposed giving Albertans five free counselling sessions to ensure that they are able to better care for their mental health. Why hasn't the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction supported our simple policy that could help so many? The Honourable, the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, on this side of the House, we have been uh, actively working with regards to the general mental health of individuals in Alberta. Our government was elected to increase access for Albertans and ensure that every Albertan has the opportunity to pursue recovery from their mental health challenges. That's why we've invested over $58 million for mental health and addiction in response to the pandemic, including $25 million for community-based organizations. This is on top of the more than a billion dollars that we spend every year on mental health and addiction care and services. We are committed to supporting Albertans in their active recovery and moving forward with treatment. The Honourable the Member for Edmonton Riverview. Given that despite the claims of the UCP that they are supporting recovery, they continue to put up barriers to people struggling with addictions. Given that this government made it impossible for those seeking pharmaceutical alternatives to toxic street drugs to access these from their primary care providers and instead forces them to go to AHS facilities, which for many is time consuming or even impossible for those living in rural areas, and given that this could force people back to the streets and result in more overdoses, why won't the minister 
reverse this decision and ensure that there are no barriers to those seeking to overcome. The Honourable the addiction. Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. The evidence is clear. When high-risk opioid narcotics are widely available, many are traded or illegally sold, and addiction and overdose rates increase. That's why we have taken steps to protect Albertans and their communities from high-risk opioid here. narcotics while still providing care to those who need it. We will continue to support Albertans in their pursuit of recovery. And Mr. Speaker, when it comes to reducing barriers, it's us who got rid of user fees under them. Even if they were accessing publicly funded recovery services, often individuals had to pay $40 a day, something addicts likely will not have. The order, the honourable member. Given that the recovery system only works if vulnerable Albertans awaiting treatment services don't die while waiting, and given that while this government brags about the treatment beds they've created, I hear from frontline workers that they are unable to access beds to support their clients. Why is the Minister of Health, Mental Health and Addictions putting up barriers for those seeking treatment? How many lives will these decisions negatively impact? How many lives will be lost? Well, the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we are proud of the work that we are doing on this file. We have gone from looking to uh, increase funding for spaces for 4,000. We actually did 8,000, so it's 19,000 now to 27,000. In fact, it was the NDP who left beds unfunded. What happened from that? By leaving treatment beds unfunded, Shame. the NDP forced a backup in into detox, into shelters, thereby onto the streets and into Shame. tents. Essentially, the policies of the NDP with regards to this file leave communities in crisis. We've seen it in LA. We see it in the downtown east side of Vancouver. We've seen it across the west coast. The order of the member for Calgary Glenmore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Southwest Calgary Ring Road project is a huge win for Calgary and Alberta. The truth is we could no longer run our north-south trade route through the middle of our city. And it has benefits for those in my constituency who no longer are limited to one way in or out of our neighbourhoods. Today, a trip to West Hills now takes seven minutes compared to the previous 25 minutes. We're now looking forward to the West Lake being completed, which will allow us to get to Windsport in 15 minutes. To the Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors, when can we see the entirety of the Southwest Calgary Ring Road, including the West Lake, open for traffic? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the construction of the final three phases of the West Calgary Ring Road will be completed in 2024. That's totaling five new kilometres of road, five kilometres upgrade to the Trans Canada Highway, and six new interchanges. But, Mr. Speaker, under NDP social procurement policies that gives control to big union bosses, provincial construction projects like the West Calgary Ring Road would have seen huge delays and cost overruns. But, Mr. Speaker, the NDP already did a pilot in Alberta, so they know this. It failed. But Gil McGowan must be pretty persistent when he's not accosting accredited members of the Legislative Press Gallery. The Honourable the Member for Calgary Glenmore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. Given that traffic on the Ring Road is growing every day as we see the project near the finish line, and given that more traffic often means more noise from the roadway, and given that my constituency borders the ever-growing traffic on the southwest Calgary Ring Road, what is the Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors doing to ensure that the noise from the Ring Road does not spill over into the communities that I represent? Question. The Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member for Calgary Glenmore has been a champion for neighbourhoods in her constituency like Cedar Bray and Woodbine. But, Mr. Speaker, we are planning to build the sound wall in Budget 2023, and hopefully the NDP will support it. But, Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't be too optimistic about the NDP voting in favour of the budget, especially when it supports Calgary. Because, Mr. Speaker, everybody knows the NDP cares more about their big union bosses and Gil McGowan than Alberta families and Alberta workers. The order, order, order. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Glenmore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the Minister for the answer. Given that noise attenuation would be a significant relief for the communities that I represent, and given that my constituents and I are advocating for the noise from the uh, Southwest Ring Road to be addressed before it further impacts our quality of life, and given that this has been an issue for quite some time now, to the Minister of Transportation and Economic Corridors, when can we expect to see shovels in the ground and the overdue noise attenuation built? The Honourable the Minister. Mr. Speaker, hopefully we'll see shovels in the ground this spring in Calgary Glenmore to mitigate this traffic noise. But, Mr. Speaker, there's been a lot of noise from what the NDP just did in BC. 
the NDP kicked out Indigenous workers who were building the Cowichan District Hospital just because they didn't hold the right NDP-approved union membership. Mr. Speaker, NDP union wars are shameful. They do not belong in Alberta. And I wonder if the NDP MLA for Edmonton Rutherford mentions to chiefs in Alberta how the NDP puts union politics over Indigenous rights. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Town of Banff is looking at a potential 10.2% increase in taxes. Town of Canmore looking at 12.3% jump. These increases can be tracked back to the actions and decisions of this UCP government and the Finance Minister. Canmore Mayor Sean Kruzik stated publicly, and I quote, Canmore, like all municipalities, has suffered from provincial downloading in one form or another, end quote. What will it take the Finance Minister to stop hammering Alberta Mountain communities with higher costs and higher taxes? Here. The Honourable the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, we're working with all municipalities to ensure that Alberta is not only prosperous today, but, Mr. Speaker, prosperous tomorrow. We inherited a fiscal train wreck from the members opposite, Mr. Speaker. Spending completely out of control. $10 billion higher than comparator provinces on a per capita basis. Mr. Speaker, we brought responsible fiscal management. At the same time, positioned Alberta's economy for competitiveness, investment attraction and growth. Mr. Speaker, we're the leading the nation in investment attraction. Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Given the fact that passing the expectation on to municipalities and say they're overspending when their budgets have been cut by the provincial government is just another example of this minister bucking all of his actions and expecting Albertans to just accept it. Given that Banff and Canmore are discussing adding a specific line about the cost of provincial downloading onto their provincial tax bills, and given that on top of piling on taxes to residents, the UCP has also repeatedly moved to silence the voices of local leaders and strip away their powers. Is the minister trying to suffocate municipalities in order to cover up their hiking costs on every Albertan? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, that's a ridiculous question. We're making key strategic infrastructure investments right across the province, Mr. Speaker. During the difficult days of COVID and the energy price crash, Mr. Speaker, we increased our capital spending envelope to municipalities so they could build critical infrastructure and, more importantly, put tens of thousands of Albertans to work. Mr. Speaker, we're bringing responsible fiscal management, management that ensures sustainable programming, sustainable programming for Albertans in the future. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that the Councillor for Canmore said what we're all thinking, the province has a $15 billion surplus, and yet they're forced to increase their taxes. And given that Albertans are facing an affordability crisis not seen in a lifetime, and given that our mountain communities already face additional costs that aren't funded due to an influx of tourists using municipal infrastructure, can the Minister explain to the UCP MLA for Banff Kananaskis why this government clearly doesn't care about her constituents? Again, Mr. Speaker, that's a ridiculous question. It's due to our responsible fiscal management, Mr. Speaker, that Alberta was able to deliver the largest affordability package of any province in the country. $2.8 billion, Mr. Speaker, over three years. And, Mr. Speaker, we made key investments in the Nordic ski area in the Banff uh, Kananaskis region. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to bring responsible fiscal management so we can build key infrastructure for Albertans in the future. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs. While no industry emerged unscathed, nonprofits were particularly under resourced throughout the pandemic. Now, as the sector begins to recover, nonprofits continue to struggle. Nonprofits fill critical needs, employ nearly 300,000 Albertans, contribute $5.5 billion to the economy, and another $5 billion in volunteer labour. Analysis by the Calgary Chamber of Voluntary Organizations shows instability. Many Alberta nonprofits are in crisis. They are calling for an urgent one time injection of $30 million, only 0.2% of the government surplus in immediate aid. Will the Minister rise in this House and commit to the more than reasonable request? Yeah. The Honourable the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you to that member for the question and her concern for the not-for-profit sector. I, I do. I share that concern, and it's why I was so happy to see our Premier uh, put that into my mandate letter to make sure that we're looking at addressing uh, wage challenges for our social sector, making sure that we are helping our social sector to be able to get through this. We rely on our not-for-profits, uh, especially during hard times, and I will continue to work with our not-for-profit leaders, uh, with my uh, colleague, the Minister of Culture, and uh, to make sure that we're supporting not-for-profits and working with them. The Honourable Edmonton Castle Downs. Given that many organizations are facing higher demand, 74% reporting an increase in need and lack of supports for programs with complex needs, and given that 41% identified significant reduction of capacity to provide services, and given that the current affordability crisis has major impacts for the sector, with 88% citing inflation as a massive concern, forcing downsizing and layoffs, while funding agreements are not keeping pace with population growth and inflation. With a $13 billion surplus and not-for-profits crying out for help before they cease to exist altogether, is, some, is providing some emergency funding really too much to ask? Honourable the Minister of Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the Honourable Member continue to raise this question. I echo with my colleague, uh, Minister of Housing and Social Services, we are on top of this, not only his uh, ministry, but mine. With the Minister of Culture last year, we increased $20 million more for community facility enhancement program. Mr. Speaker, we're on top of this, helping our burden recover. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs. Unfortunately, it seems that this government doesn't actually listen to the experts in this sector who serve important roles in their very own backyards. Given the government, Private Members Bill 202 is only beneficial to charitable organizations, and given that the majority of nonprofits do not have charitable status to accept donations and issue tax receipts, and given that this is a poor measure to compensate for grant funding not keeping up with inflation. Will the minister take the experts seriously, listen to their concerns, and move forward with their incredibly reasonable asks? Yes. The Honourable the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for her, her question, her advocacy. Uh, and I'm actually glad that she brought up the Honourable Member uh, for Peace Rivers uh, Bill, Bill 202, Bill 202 uh, because I know that that will have a significant impact for not-for-profits, it'll give our community, it'll give Albertans a meaningful way to be able to engage in the solutions. And at the end of the day, that's a big part of what we need here. We need to make sure that all Albertans are involved with it. So I, I thank that honourable member for bringing that forward. We are taking real action, though, and one of the most recent things we've done is we actually put $20 million into food banks to help address some of these issues. Here, here. The honourable member for Calgary Beddingtons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to be part of this government that has us held in the light on the spending and aligned debt with the other provinces. This has allowed the governments to fully benefit from the recent surge in energy prices, which has given us the largest surplus in Alberta's history and projected the $12.3 billion for the 2022-23 fiscal years. To the Minister of Finance, how does our spending record compare to the end DP on sustainable rate of spending increases. The Honourable the Minister of Finance, the President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that important question. Mr. Speaker, I've mentioned more than once in this House that our government inherited a fiscal train wreck from the NDP. We were spending over $10 billion more than comparator provinces on a per capita basis. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to say we brought our spending under control. We're now comparable on a per capita basis with other provinces, Mr. Speaker. More than that, our revenues are going up because of higher energy prices and higher tax revenues due to a booming economy. The Honourable Member for Calgary Bennington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and then uh, thank you for the questions uh, answered from the ministers. Uh, given that the fiscal restraint that has allowed the governments uh, to fully benefit from the recent boom in the energy prices and to attain the, the largest surplus in our province's history, the government has been able to use the surplus to make the largest debt repayment.
Department of Water History and the Stockholm so the $13.4 billion against the minister. How much of the annual interest payments has this debt repayments allowed Alberta to save by not having to raise tax and pass on the additional debt to our children? The Honourable the Minister of Finance. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the member for the question. Our, our government continues to build a prosperous economic future for all Albertans, and paying down debt's a key priority. We are paying down $13.4 billion in debt this year, debt that is maturing this year. Mr. Speaker, if we had to go to capital markets today with increased cost of capital, in increased interest rates, Mr. Speaker, we would be paying about $600 million more per year in debt service costs if we had not paid off the $13.4 billion. Mr. Speaker, res fiscal responsibility matters. Well, the member for Calgary Bennington. Speaker, thank you. Thank you again to the ministers. Given that the fiscal restraint is showing by this UCP government over the lack of restraint in the previous NDP governments is crystal clear with their figures. And can the Minister of Finance share with this House how important will this saving for the Alberta governments to be able to provide significant financial relief to the Albertans during this inflationary crisis? Good question. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we are in an inflationary time, and that's putting pressure on all Alberta households, Mr. Speaker. Responsible fiscal management and a growing economy has allowed, again, this government to respond to this uh, crisis, this challenge, with the most programming of any province across the country, Mr. Speaker. $2.8 billion of relief, both in tax reductions and direct support, Mr. Speaker. Again. We will continue to bring responsible fiscal management to the province so that governments in the future can respond appropriately to challenges. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Northwest is next. Yesterday, Member for Calgary Buffalo and I sent a letter to the presidents of post-secondary institutions inviting proposals for a new downtown Calgary campus. Calgary's downtown vacancy rate is still at about 30 percent. Mr. Speaker, downtown campuses are awesome. They spur on the average a creation of more startups, more um, licensing deals, more inventions, and more investment in the downtown. This is a plan that would do, uh, support downtown Calgary, post-secondary institutions, and Calgary in general. Will the advanced education rise and endorse this vital project that we're proposing? What about the Minister of Advanced Education? Well, Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to chat with the member and get a better understanding. You know, I watched the uh, press conference and uh, I left scratching my head. I didn't hear details about a budget. I didn't hear any details about timelines. I think the member, uh, my colleague, mentioned it earlier. It seemed as though it was a plan to develop a plan. So I'm not sure I can stand and get behind it uh, without any real details, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but I'd love to find out more as to uh, what the what they have in store, because from the press conference, it was clear that this was just scribbled together on the back of a, of a cocktail napkin on their way down to Edmonton, Mr. Speaker. The order, order, the honourable member for Edmonton. Uh, well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I can certainly lend the advanced education minister a hand, if that's what he wants. Given that the UCP is still imposing additional, unnecessary billions of dollars in debt on Albertans pursuing post-secondary through unprecedented funding cuts and skyrocketing tuition, and given that this means that students are requiring loans that have to take on a significantly larger burden, given as well that the government hasn't even included the majority of students in their inflation relief legislation, why is the Minister of Advanced Education doing nothing to help students with the cost of living. Please the, answer. The Honourable the Minister of Advanced Education. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as per the uh, mandate letter uh, from the Premier, of course, the Premier has asked uh, for us to take a look as it relates to affordability, and I know that that's a consistent theme across all ministries. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, my team and I are speaking very closely with uh, student leaders to get a better understanding of uh, some of their challenges and get a better understanding as to whether the government may be able to provide uh, assistance uh, to work uh, with students. Uh, and so we're looking at those options and we'll uh, bring forward some thoughtful plans in the future, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. 
Mr. Speaker, given that this government's Inflation Act missed more than 2 million Albertans, including almost all of the post-secondary students in this province, yeah. it's given as well that the Alberta New Democrats do have a plan from capping post-secondary tuition increases, ending the UCP surcharge on student loans, bringing students and research into the downtown core, ensuring stable, predictable funding for institutions, and making post-secondary career training more accessible, and so, so much more. My last question is simple. Does the minister want to offer my help so that we can put together what's best for students? Yeah. Well, the minister of uh, affordability and utilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that Albertans are struggling under a high inflation and the related escalated cost of living, and that includes our students. And I, we've been meeting together and discussing options to support them as we move forward, and that's exactly what we'll do. Right now, they're benefiting from cheaper fuel to get to and from school. They're benefiting from lower electricity prices and natural gas price protection. And students will benefit from the targeted relief that our government is releasing early next year. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Meadows has a question. Mr. Speaker, Alberta is a rich province, rich in diversity and multiculturalism. But racism continues to find a home on our street, in our school, workplaces, in our media and in this very building. It is the duty of every Albertan, especially those in position of power, to stamp out racism in all its forms. To do otherwise is morally bankrupt. Can the Minister of Multiculturalism explain what tangible action this government is taking to address racism in Alberta? Please be specific. Albertans are looking to us to lead. The Honourable the Minister of Trade, Immigration and Multiculturalism. Thank you to the Honourable Member for that question. And first of all, I'd like to thank the former Minister of Multiculturalism, the Honourable Member from Calgary North, for his groundbreaking work on the Anti-Racism Action Plan. And in fact, this plan is on our website, and it outlines a number of recommendations and a forward plan that is designed to tackle anti-racism. Edmonton Meadows. Given that racism has been on the rise in Alberta, and given that the Calgary and Edmonton Gurdwara Sahibs were the target of hate crimes last year, and given that only a few months ago a racist representation of Sikh culture was included in a rural Alberta rodeo parade, and given that 24 years old Sikh man was murdered last week in Edmonton, newcomers are scared. Racism is on the rise, and minorities are facing daily instances of racism in their lives. Will the Premier stand in this chamber today and condemn? Racism in all okay. its forms. The Honourable the Minister of Trade, Immigration and Multiculturalism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And these are tragic and unacceptable acts. And obviously, I do condemn all acts of racism all across the province and in our nation. And we have seen with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen increases in anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian hate, which was addressed earlier here today. And I am very personally invested as a minister, as an MLA, as an individual, to ensure that we tackle racism so that every single Albertan feels included, welcomed, and is able to actualize their potential in every realm of life. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Meadows. Given that third-party advertiser that calls itself Alberta First recently released a television ad that is undeniably racist, yep. and given that the ad is black and white but colors only the turban of a federal political leader, and given that this is a clearly a visual dog whistle on racism, and given that fighting racism is the duty of every person in this House, including the Premier, well, some men on that side stand and, for the record, condemn this racist ad and tell the people behind it to pull it off the air. Here, 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 here. Honorable the Minister. Speaker, as I had mentioned before, I categorically condemn all acts of racism everywhere in the province and in the country as well. And I have had the benefit of uh, talking to the Anti-Racism Council members as a council and as members individually. And again, we are going to be bringing forward further initiatives on this matter to make sure that, again, that everybody feels safe and included and welcomed in this province. The Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod has a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, as an MLA who represents rural Albertans, my constituents are pleading for more stable health care. Currently, emergency rooms in rural communities are being left inaccessible due to doctor shortages and closures. Because of these closures, rural Albertans are being left without critical emergency care. 
To the Minister of Health, what is this government doing to improve and stabilize emergency room accessibility in our rural communities? The Honourable the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question and, and advocacy on this file. We've had num numerous conversations in this regard. You know, Mr. Speaker, bringing down emergency uh, room wait times across the province is one of our top priorities. In fact, one of the main reasons why we appointed an AHS administrator. We have tasked Dr. Cowell to reduce ER delays by bringing in additional staff to improve on-site patient care and management and transferring an increased number of patients from hospital beds into more appropriate care settings. Uh, in order to measure the success of these initiatives, we will track the time it takes from the moment a patient enters the ER to when they receive the appropriate level of care. The Honourable Member for Livingston McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the incredible strain that the pandemic has had on our doctors, our nurses and support staff over the past two years, and given the lack of staff in rural regions, many Alberta families are struggling to access the health care services that they require. Can the Minister explain to Albertans and this House what the government is doing to bring more doctors and health care workers to our rural hospitals, thus improving access to health care for these communities? The Honourable the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, we fully understand that there is a, a challenge across the entire country on health human resources uh, here in Alberta, and it's particularly acute in rural Alberta, uh, which actually is impacting our level of service. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are moving forward with a number of initiatives, including uh, training more uh, more nurses and allied health professionals across the uh, the entire province. Uh, we are leveraging our immigration system, welcoming more doctors. Uh, uh, and, Mr. Speaker, we have more doctors and more nurses than ever in the province, and we're going to continue to do this work until we can get all the staffing we need to provide the services, particularly in rural areas. Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that this government has announced $3.5 billion in health-related capital funding over the next three years, and given that a significant portion of this amount is dedicated to upgrading facilities in Red Deer, Calgary and Edmonton, and given that those upgrades will improve the quality of service and life for residents in those regions, Again, to the Minister of Health, these urban centres are receiving significant support for health care upgrades, but what is this government doing to help improve health care services and facilities for rural Albertans? Minister of Health. Thanks once again to the Honourable Member for the question. Mr. Speaker, you know, we are investing significantly in, uh, in infrastructure, health care infrastructure, uh, $3.5 billion in uh, Budget 2022. Uh, and that is across the entire province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and one, one component of that is focusing on uh, renovations in rural hospitals. This year's budget provides $45 million over three years to modernize and improve our rural health facilities across the province. Now, the Rural Health Facilities Revitalization Program supports upgrades and renovations in hospitals, emergency departments, pharmacies, EMS stations, ambulance garages, medical laboratories, and other facilities, and we'll continue to invest. Here. Honourable members, that concludes the time allotted for oral question period. In 30 seconds or less, we will return to the remainder of the daily routine. Tabling returns and reports. Are there tablings? Ooh, this is a little tricky right now. Uh, the Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung has a tabling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have two tablings uh, quickly uh, that I'll make uh, tablings documents I referenced earlier this week in debate. One being titled a CTV News article titled Ralph Fox 14 Years Later, which I referenced in uh, uh, arguing that the population of Alberta will not be bought with their own money again, uh, as they uh, seem to be back in the Ralph Fox era. And secondly, a tabling uh, with respect to an article that I cited uh, from CBC, Need for Speed, UCP MLA wants to see 120 km per hour speed limit, where I argued that it was difficult to determine whether or not the UCP uh, members were in favour of uh, higher speed limits. Uh, or not, because there seems to be some debate in their caucus about uh, whether they are injurious. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, <coughs> table the requisite number of copies of the letter from uh, the Confederacy of Treaty Six Nations, a statement from the Treaty Six Chiefs, 
regarding their meeting with Premier Daniel Smith in which they indicate it was clear from our discussions that Premier Smith does not understand treaty or our inherent rights, nor does she respect them. Thank you. I appreciate that the Honourable Member may have been quoting from a letter, but it would still be inappropriate to use the proper name in the Assembly. Are there others? Seeing none. Tablings to the Clerk. Orders of the day. Orders du jour. Government bills and orders for third reading Bill 4, Alberta Health Care Insurance Amendment Act 2022. Honourable Mr. Coffey. The Honourable the Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again for the support of the Assembly on Bill 4, the Alberta Health Care Insurance Amendment Act 2022. As member knows, it is a straightforward bill that proposes repealing Section 40.2 of the Alberta Health Care Insurance Act. This section allows the government uh, to, terminate, to terminate compensation-related agreements, such as the one we have with the Alberta Medical Association. Repealing this legislation is part of our commitment in the new agreement with the AMA. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this commitment is not only to the Alberta Medical Association, but to physicians throughout our province. I want physicians to know that we are moving forward together. With this agreement, we are partners, and they have my commitment that I will work collaboratively with the association and its members to continue building an environment of partnership and of innovation. To physicians, I say that you have faced a tremendous amount of responsibility and strain throughout the past few challenging years. It's affected many personally and professionally as you have given all your support to patients. Your hard work and dedication to Albertans is greatly appreciated. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our partnership with physicians is reflected in the concrete actions we're taking to address the challenges facing our health care system. Because those actions reflect the very issues that have been brought forward by physicians in our conversations. And these actions will result in improvements to the health system overall and improvements for individual physicians as we work together as partners to implement the new agreement. This agreement adds an estimated $750 million to stabilize the health care system, including $260 million in targeted funding to address current pressures. This includes recruitment and retention programs so more Albertans can access family doctors and provides more stability for practice viability. It is an agreement that focuses on partnership, stability and innovation. It targets areas of concern and provides the necessary supports to help ensure Albertans get the health care that they need. To quote from former president of the AMA, Dr. Vesta Michelle Warren, with whom I sat at the bargaining table and then proudly shared a podium in September when we announced the ratification of the agreement, quote, this agreement is good for physicians, patients, and the healthcare system. It will allow physicians to contribute to decision-making and provide expertise on what matters for patients. It provides increases in line with other settlements, valuable programs, business cost support, fair processes for working together on compensation or other matters, and ways to resolve disputes. The agreement will help stabilize physician practices that are struggling with rising costs, and stability is critical to retain and attract physicians. There is hard work ahead, but we look forward to rebuilding the relationship with government and seeking solutions through collaboration." End quote. Mr. Speaker, there is indeed hard work ahead, but I am looking forward to continued collaboration with the current President of the AMA, Dr. Rinaldi, and the rest of her team to tackle this work together with physicians as our partners in the weeks and months ahead. This bill is about working with physicians to improve Alberta's health care system. It's about stability, which is absolutely critical during these challenging times, and it's about keeping our promises and our commitments. So I once again thank all members of the Assembly in supporting Bill 4. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I move to adjourn debate on third reading of the Alberta Health Care Insurance Amendment Act. Thank you. Having heard the motion by the Honourable Minister of Health to adjourn debate, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Carried. Committee of the Whole. Honourable members, I would like to call the committee to order. 
The Committee of the Whole has under consideration Bill 5, the Justice Statutes Amendment Act 2022. Are there any comments, questions, or amendments to be offered with respect to this bill? I see the Honourable Member from Calgary, Buller McCall. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak to Bill 5, Justice Statute Amendment Act, that changes, makes changes to six pieces of legislation. Uh, However, I do find that this session, this government has uh, for most part prioritized legislation that will not uh, help this government address issues uh, facing our communities, our province. Uh, frankly, when I talk to individual and groups in my riding. I think top of mind issue for them uh, is affordability, uh, cost of living, and UCP policies certainly have contributed uh, to, to that as well. Other thing that we'll talk about is healthcare. That is top of mind for many of my constituents. And we are now seeing an increase in surge in respiratory illnesses. And now our uh, hospitals are again really stretched. And here we have uh, another bill that is not uh, focused on what Albertans want this government to focus on. And earlier they also introduced a piece of legislation, uh, Sovereignty Act, that will drive away investment, that will uh, drive away jobs, and has created a huge chaos and uncertainty, uncertainty in our economy. And this bill makes a number of changes. For most part, it will be helpful uh, if the minister would uh, clarify some of these issues. For instance, this bill makes amendments to Referendum Act. And what it does, uh, in technical briefing, they said that they are clarifying that constitutional uh, referendums will only be brought before the legislation. In all other referendums, cabinet can decide behind <coughs> closed doors. So they are creating a two-tier process if a referendum relates to constitutional issues, only then that will be brought before this assembly. And on all other issues, on all other matters of public importance, cabinet is giving themselves the right to decide that without any input from this legislature. As much, I'm not a big fan of governing through referendums. This legislature should be the uh, governing body. This government, elected government, should be the governing body. And we have seen uh, fallout from referendum in Brexit and other places as well. But I do believe uh, that when every question is put before uh, public to weigh in, this legislature should have a right to weigh in 
on that matter. Generally speaking, referendums are done on matter of public importance where we want to know where public stands on a certain issue. So I think as public representatives, uh, we do have a right to weigh in on those matters. So I think we will be uh, bringing forward an amendment to later on to change that. And I don't think that cabinet should be the only body that decides our referendum. And this is the kind of pattern we are seeing from this government. That's exactly what uh, they did uh, with their Sovereignty Act. And they didn't consult anyone. They tried to uh, consolidate powers within the cabinet. And as a result, earlier we saw uh, a call from Treaty 6 chiefs about that piece of legislation as well, that they were not consulted, so that bill should be withdrawn. And same thing here. Uh, there is nothing to suggest that the government uh, consulted on these changes that they are making to uh, referendum act. This bill will also make some changes to Inter-Jurisdictional Support Order Act. And that's a pretty straightforward change. That change will bring Alberta legislation in line with other provinces and will allow for the expedited enforcement of child and spousal support order uh, from other provinces and vice versa. So that's a good change. Uh, and we can certainly uh, support that, that change. Another change is to Provincial Court Act, which will change the limit, financial limit for the Provincial Court that they can deal, deal with. Currently, it stands at 50,000, but now, through this change, uh, Cabinet is giving itself flexibility that they could raise it to, uh, I believe, 200,000. And I think question we have is if Alberta is uh, already in line with other jurisdictions, other provinces, and in fact, Alberta is at the higher end of the bracket. Uh, why does cabinet feel that this was necessary? And was there uh, any consultation uh, done with courts, provincial court, court of Queen's bench? Was there any uh, work done that how it will impact their case loads, how it will impact the provincial court work. Do we have uh, enough uh, judges there? Are we just trying to push more and more Albertans uh, towards provincial court? Because King's Bench would uh, need involvement of uh, legal representation, and provincial court has a relatively simpler process. So I think we need to understand that why cabinet thinks that they need this power to raise uh, that limit, uh, civil court uh, limit to 200,000. Uh, again, who is asking for it? And are there any plans that uh, they will be using it fairly soon? We do know that uh, because of the pandemic, and because of this government policies, our courts are struggling. Because of Jordan principle, there are now time limits that cases have to be dealt with in certain time frame. Um, in, eight, in 18 months for some of the offenses and 30 
months for indictable offenses. So that has put, also put pressure on the court system. And at the same time, uh, this government has cut Justice Department budget every single year. Every single year, they have cut Justice Department budget. When they became government, they started promising that they will hire 50 prosecutors. That didn't happen up until now. And if they have hired some, now there are so many more vacancies that have not been filled. So adding more casework, more caseload on uh, provincial courts, if that's their plan to address delays, they should say so. Other thing that has uh, really caused delays, caused concern for many Albertans is that this government has also cut legal aid funding. They have made deep cuts to legal aid funding. Mr. Chair, when we became uh, government in 2015, the total legal aid funding at that time was $64 million. And in 2018, we entered into a governance agreement with uh, Legal Aid Alberta and promised to increase it in four installment by $70 million. And we delivered the first installment, making the legal aid funding $104 million. And in last three years, this government has cut that funding, making it $82 million. And as we speak, there are many organizations representing defense lawyers, family lawyers. They have started job action, and they are not accepting legal aid certificates. That means there will be more delays when it comes to bail hearings. There will be more delays in criminal matters, in family law matters, in custody matters. And Alberton will not be fairly represented. So our court system is already under pressure. And just adding uh, this limit, raising this limit to 200,000, I don't think will make any difference in our court system. If we want to see our court system improve, we need real action from this government. We need more prosecutors. We need more resources in justice system. We need more resources for legal aid. Changing that limit won't help us address any of that. Then there are some other changes to Trustee Act, which we were briefed that uh, it will just remove the need for a trust to be transferred to the courts uh, when there is no trustee and clarifies that property can go directly uh, to the new trustee. I think that's a good thing and there was uh, some assurance provided that in that process, a trust won't fail. Then there are some changes made to uh, Sales of uh, God Act, Goods Act and it removes the need to keep a record of the vehicle and registration that delivered the grain to the elevator and changes uh, track buyer to uh, grain dealer. I think we didn't hear any concerns uh, with respect to these change. And my friend and colleague or critic uh, for agriculture, MLA from Edwinter Manning, who has done uh, amazing work on her file she has also reached out to stakeholders, but we didn't hear any concerns. We would like to hear from the government who they have consulted and if they could uh, explain rationale for that. I think in general, uh, we think that it's a, it's a good change. But as I said, that these are uh, the changes 
they are fairly straightforward, but at the same time, uh, I think this government need to focus on uh, real issues that are facing uh, our economy, that are facing our society. They need to do something tangible to address uh, cost of living crisis, inflationary crisis, and when they come up with uh, plans, they need to make sure that all Albertans who need those supports, who need that help, are able to access that help. But we saw from this government that they left out more than two million Albertans out of that support. Similarly, uh, making changes to Referendum Act further erodes the role of this legislature. And what we have seen from this government, that's a pattern of behavior that they have done many things to curtail the role of this legislature and to erode our democracy. On many occasions, they have brought forward closure motions just to shut down the debate. They brought that Sovereignty Act at one point, giving themselves the powers called Henry VIII power. So again, they can limit the role of legislature. In, in this legislation as well, with respect to changes to uh, referendum act, what they are doing that they are again limiting the role of this legislature by eliminating the need for this government to bring referendums on questions of questions other than constitutional question to this legislature. I think as member of uh, this legislature, as representative of the people of this province, we think whenever this government feels that there is a need, that they need to govern through referendum, they should come to this legislature. It shouldn't be just the cabinet playing politics with referendums. There should be some accountability through this house. So those changes certainly are not good. They are not good for our democracy. They are not good for our province. So as I indicated, that we will consider uh, amending those to make sure that uh, government brings back all questions of importance, whether constitutional or not, to this House. Other thing, as I raise some questions, it would be helpful that if Minister will share with us that who they have consulted on all these changes. Because we also know when it comes to consultation, this government's record is very poor. They do not consult. They claim to consult, but they do not. That what they claim with respect to Sovereignty Act. That what they claim with respect to Bill 6 that we will be debating later today. But when we talk to uh, stakeholders, when we talk to Albertans, then we find out that they did not consult. And that's the reason that Treaty 6 chiefs issued a statement today saying that we were not consulted 
on Sovereignty Act and on many other issues that pertains to their treaty rights that has potential to other members wishing to add comment or ask questions. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Beverly Clearview. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's uh, my pleasure to rise and speak to Bill 5, <clears throat> the Justi Justice Statutes Amendment Act. <clears throat> now, there's, uh, I have a few questions um, pertaining to the bill. Uh, appreciate the fact that it amends, I believe it's six, six acts, um, or six pieces of legislation. Um, I'll go through them uh, one at a time, uh, just to make it uh, as logical as possible. Um, you know, I appreciate uh, on the uh, Interjurisdictional Support Orders Act um, that it is, for the most part, from what I can see, uh, bringing Alberta legislation uh, in line with other provinces. Um, I do appreciate uh, that it will allow for um, expedited enforcement of, of child and spousal support orders from other provinces um, and through really modernizing a piece of legislation by allowing um, uh, easier use and, and transmission of documents. And so, um, you know, I appreciate section uh, 524 removes the need for sworn documents. Uh, Section 6, 24, and 25 uh, remove the need for certified documents or at least provide some flexibility uh, for that certification, uh, which I think is, uh, is important. Um, section 10, 30, 39, 44 allow for electronic or telephone transmission of documents. Uh, appreciate there that, uh, that we're modernizing this to allow for electronic uh, transmission of documents in today's day and age, uh, this seems uh, to, make, uh, to make the most sense. I can't help but think about the fact that uh, most doctor's offices still use fax machines uh, to fax um, requisitions, etc. around, uh, which, you know, my hope is that we will um, look at modernizing that system um, because uh, there uh, is an example of a constituent of mine that I discovered while door knocking um, ahead of the 2015 election, who, um, you know, went to see a specialist because of, uh, 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 well, to get a diagnosis, or no, sorry, she had a, a cancer diagnosis, went to see a specialist, um, that was, the requisition was via fax, and the challenge, uh, Mr. Chair, is that the requisition ended up in a pile of papers for the specialist. The specialist was on holidays for a couple of months and, uh, and then couldn't get back uh, to the paperwork or didn't, didn't realize it was there. Um, and uh, the worst possible thing you can think of happened, Mr. Chair, and that is that she died. She died because she couldn't get treatment um, because of an antiquated system that we use uh, in our, our healthcare system, which is, uh, you know, the use of fax machines. And so, you know, it was very, very tragic, um, Mr. Speaker or Mr. Chair. And I'd uh, met with her while she was waiting for treatment and then was in touch with the family uh, when she passed. Uh, several weeks later. Of course, I advocated uh, on her behalf and tried to do, my office tried to do what we could. Um, but the point of the story, uh, Mr. Chair, is that, you know, I, I can support pieces of legislation that uh, make sense to modernize, um, especially the use of, of documentation. Um, and so we know uh, how busy our, uh, our, our, court systems are, um, and so, um, you know, so that's, that's appreciated. I mean, in, in Section 17 of this piece of legislation uh, amending, again, the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Act, um, removes the need for statutory certified copies. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, I think that um, is, will help 
improve as well. Uh, so, you know, for, for the, the first piece of legislation that, um, that this bill amends, um, you know, I can get behind that, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next piece is the Le Legislative Assembly Act. Um, I appreciate um, that this will bring Alberta in line with other jurisdictions. Um, and that's uh, looking, I, I, I believe, it, at enhancing security. Uh, for uh, for uh, personnel in this building, um, again, uh, you know, it makes sense that we bring our legislation in line with other provinces, um, and it's you know this bill does touch on another bill that we'll be debating uh, this afternoon, uh, Mr. Speaker, which um, you know that there's there's clarification uh, in changes to the Police Act, which we'll be debating. Uh, later this afternoon uh, for increased civilian oversight of law enforcement personnel. Um, and I think that's very important, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, that we have civilian oversight. Um, when I speak to Bill, uh, when I speak to Bill 6, I will, uh, you know, start my comments thanking uh, the men and women that serve um, our communities uh, around the province that risk their lives day in and day out to keep us safe. Um, there are incredible, incredible people who, who join the service. And um, as I said, when I, when I speak to Bill 6, I'll tell a couple stories about uh, some of the, uh, the men and women that I've gotten to know uh, in my riding. Um, and I would argue that uh, out of uh, EPS, the finest uh, work in Northeast Edmonton, um, and of course, I'm quite biased because I've gotten to know many of them. Um, but uh, so we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, when we get there, Mr. Chair. The next piece of legislation, the third piece that this act uh, uh, amends is the Provincial Court Act. Um, and so um, this, I think, the, the rationale behind this change the government has outlined that it'll give cabinet uh, more flexibility, uh, but the, the, the concern that the opposition has identified with this change, uh, and again, when we talk about potential unintended consequences, um, it could lead to an increase in claims through the lower courts. Um, and so um, that is a bit of, uh, of, a, of a flag. The, um, the other thing that it does, Mr. Chair, is that it increases the maximum decision under uh, civil courts from, uh, from $50,000 to $200,000. Now, I know my, my colleague, uh, our justice critic, ha has spoken about this already, but I think it's important um, to highlight this. As I said at the start of my, my uh, speaking this afternoon, Mr. Chair, there's a few questions that I have, and, and this increasing the level fourfold from 50,000 to 200,000, uh, again, a 400% increase is significant. Um, now, the, the, the second highest, so that would put Alberta at the highest level, at 200,000. The, um, I think the existing highest level in the country is 85,000. So Alberta would jump over that by another $115,000. Okay. And so, um, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, a number of things, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure why Cabinet feels the need to quadruple from the 50,000 uh, cap on civil court rulings that, that Alberta currently has today, why it needs to jump to 200,000. Now, I'm not saying, Mr. Chair, that I'm necessarily opposed to that decision. I just would like, uh, a little more rationale behind that that decision and that that uh, that increase and my, my hope quite frankly mr. chair because we are in committee of the whole uh, that a member um, from executive council uh, will respond uh, to some of the questions that the opposition has been raising um, you know this is uh, definitely part of our, our bill debate process where I very much appreciated going back and forth with ministers um, we've seen that uh, that openness or, or willingness to uh, answer questions 
um, in the past on other pieces of legislation, and I've seen this, especially in my, my tenure time in this uh, chamber. And so my hope is that we will get some answers. Um, you know, the, the other question I have is if the cap is raised to $200,000, uh, would that not lead to increased cases being brought through the civil courts? Um, and if that's the case, Mr. Chair, um, what plans does the government have um, to support the lower courts in increasing uh, their capacity? So again, if this, if this cap being raised to $200,000 um, has a snowball effect or a knock-on effect, um, you know, has the government planned for this? Have they accounted for it? I would imagine that Executive Council would have thought this through, that this is likely one of the consequences. Um, that would stem from increasing the cap from 50,000 to 200,000. Um, you know, if they haven't thought of that, well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, happy that the opposition has, has uh, identified that. And so, you know, the logical question is, well, then how do we support the lower courts to be able to do with this, to be able to deal with this increased caseload um, and workload? Um, the next question is, is a simple one, is, is when does Cabinet expect that they're going to amend the regulation on the cap? Um, is this uh, an urgent uh, issue? Is this uh, one of the top priorities for government? Uh, again, I don't want to diminish the importance of, of this change, but I do know that when I talk to my constituents and when I talk to Albertans in general, you know, issues that are urgent or pressing um, this isn't one of the, the issues that, that is raised to me. Again, I'm not trying to diminish the value of, of this change. But when I think about urgent and pressing issues, I think about our healthcare system and the strain that it's under. I think about um, the number of, of kids who can't uh, get in to see doctors within a reasonable time frame. Uh, again, there's a number of hospitals that have brought in temporary trailers uh, to act as waiting rooms. Um, that's unheard of in my lifetime. And, uh, you know, I've, I've spent uh, getting close to five decades on this planet and, and lived in Alberta my whole life and, and have not heard of, of that. Um, five decades? In, uh, in, <laughs> in, in the past. And so when I think about, you know, urgency and what, what should be a priority and top of mind for government, I think about affordability. I think about every Albertan on every door that I've knocked on um, for the last couple of months raises the issue of, of inflation, rising costs, you know, whether it's gasoline at the pumps, whether it's paying for food in the grocery store. And I've heard time and time again of stories of families that have completely changed their diet because they simply cannot afford to eat the way they did. And, and Mr. Chair, we're not talking about families going out and buying steak and lobster dinners. Uh, often or even from time to time. We're talking about some basic staple food, but costs have risen so much so that um, they just simply can't afford it. So, you know, I appreciate uh, that we, we are debating Bill 2 that deals with um, the government's approach to addressing um, rising costs and inflation. Of course, you know, the opposition have, uh, have some... Uh, difference of opinion in, in how to best address that. Um, I can say that I supported Bill 2 in its second reading um, because I think that there are some initiatives in there that will help families. But when we look at issues that are most pressing for Albertans, um, from what I've heard on the doorsteps, it's, it's rising costs um, and it's, it's the crisis in health care. So, uh, you know, to come back to uh, this bill, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, you know, when, when uh, Cabinet expects that they're going to amend the regulation um, on this cap uh, and would appreciate, uh, appreciate knowing, uh, uh, getting an answer to that uh, throughout uh, Committee of the Whole, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, the next section I'm going to talk about here is um, the Referendum Act. Um, and that, within this uh, piece of legislation, makes it clear that non-constitutional referendums uh, do not require a motion by the Assembly uh, prior to it being ordered. Uh, so, of course, constitutional referendums will uh, require the passage of a motion 
uh, by the Legislative Assembly prior to uh, being ordered. Um, and so I, I appreciate the comments that my colleague gave just around, you know, the use of referendums and, and when we use them. Um, I think there definitely is a, a time and a place for a referendum. I do think, and I'm sure you have as well, Mr. Chair, that when we go in and speak to grade six classes uh, who study provincial government in the grade six curriculum, uh, we talk about the difference between direct democracy and representative democracy. And, um, you know, of course, uh, direct democracy uh, many, many years ago, uh, uh, you know, was the common um, style of governance. However, um, today I can't even imagine uh, a country uh, like Canada trying to, to implement representative or a direct democracy where we're going to the citizens every time we want to make a decision. So uh, naturally, um, you know, our representative democracy, I think, has served, um, has served for the most part um, our citizens quite well. And so, you know, having said that, um, there are times when uh, governments have chosen to go to a referendum uh, to, uh, to its citizens to enable them within a four-year term to have a say on, on a specific issue. Um, I appreciate that, uh, that my colleague, uh, the Justice Critic, had mentioned in his comments that, uh, you know, given the choice, he prefers that decisions uh, are made, for the most part, through this assembly. Um, so we are all uh, elected uh, to, uh, to represent our constituents. But uh, that's a, a smaller change to the Referendum Act. Uh, two acts to go, uh, Mr. Chair. One is the Sale of Goods Act. Um, and that one, uh, quite frankly, I'm, I'm still trying to, um, trying to um, sink my teeth into uh, just the changes that it's made. So my, my initial understanding of this is really... Um, under the Sale of Goods Act, just making changes uh, to the, the Provincial Act to align with, with the federal government uh, and federal legislation. I shouldn't say federal government, federal legislation. Um, and so Section 25 specifically removes the need to keep a record of the vehicle and registration that delivered the grain to the elevator. Um, now, my interpretation and understanding of that, yes, it's bringing it in line. You know, it, if this is going to make it more efficient and, and reduce, um, you know, an extra burden, um, then I'm in, in favor of it. Um, if, again, industry uh, has said, listen, we don't need this, uh, this is once upon a time we did, today we don't, um, then I'm completely in support of that. A question I know other colleagues have asked is, is who the government consulted with. Um, my hope is that excuse me, the agricultural sector and, and some of the associations uh, have weighed in on this. And, and, and if they haven't, then, I mean, that's a, a pretty big flag uh, for me. My hope is that uh, there was consultation and engagement with our agricultural sector um, on this change. Uh, it also changes the track buyer to uh, the grain dealer, which once again... Um, you know, if it's, uh, if, it's, if it's just cleaning up legislation, uh, then that's great. If there's an additional benefit of, uh, of reducing, um, you know, some red tape for, uh, for our hardworking farmers, then, uh, then I'm also uh, in support of that. And finally, Mr. Chair, uh, the Trustee Act. Um, now, these changes, um, my understanding is they, they address concerns that were raised under Bill 12 from our spring session. So it makes changes uh, to the new Trustee Act that removes the need for a trustee to be transferred to the courts if there's no trustee and clarifies that in these situations um, the trustee remains intact until a new trustee is appointed. Again, if this provides a little more continuity um, and, and um, simplicity to a system and ensures that people aren't being bounced around and having to go through uh, a lengthy and uh, uh, complicated process, then absolutely I'm in uh, uh, support of, of this change. Um, and so, uh, again, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate that, uh, that, that this bill amends six different pieces of legislation, is looking to, uh, to provide some, some clarification for some, uh, bringing other pieces in line with federal legislation. 
uh, and recognize um, that and the need for that. Um, but I can't help but think about the other pressing, urgent issues uh, that, uh, that the government should be uh, uh, working on, whether through legislation um, or through, through regulations or just programs and supports. That, uh, again, Albertans are uh, struggling. Thank you, Honourable Member. Others with comments or questions? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton West Ending. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a privilege to rise this afternoon and speak to Bill 5, the Justice Statutes Amendment Act, and I have appreciated the uh, points made by my colleagues so far this afternoon on this legislation uh, and through the entirety uh, of the discussion on this uh, bill. And I, too, have some questions that I'm hopeful we can uh, maybe have addressed as we continue through uh, this debate. Um, you know, I, I do think that there are some pieces as the last speaker did uh, within this legislation that uh, are removing red tape, uh, that are going to uh, streamline some of the process, and I think that is uh, important. Of course, uh, some changes to the Sale of Goods Act, which was previously described. Uh, the previous member honestly did quite a good job of going uh, through the entirety of this legislation, so I likely won't spend as much time on every piece as, as the member from Edmonton, Beverly, Clareview, but I, I do appreciate uh, uh, again, some of the streamlining of, of pieces uh, specific to the Sale of Goods Act, uh, specific to uh, the Trustee Act. Um, and I do, uh, however, have some questions that uh, likely have been brought up so far, and again, hopefully we can uh, receive some answers. Um, you know, just looking at the Provincial Court Civil Claims Limit Amendment Act, and uh, as many speakers have already, uh, find this uh, change interesting, looking at uh, civil claims and the uh, the limit previously or currently being 50000 and moving up to a maximum of $200,000 and the government uh, is expressing that this is going to uh, reduce pressures on courts and enable more Albertans to file small claims at the provincial level as per the alberta.ca website and the uh, briefing on this uh, Bill 5 legislation. Uh, but I am a little hesitant uh, surrounding this and, um, you know, I, I would appreciate if the government is willing to provide some more uh, detail and some more context uh, to what that might look like at a higher uh, court if it's going to reduce some of the strains there because uh, we, I think, uh, have all heard stories of, of uh, the strain that is uh, happening in our higher courts and so I agree that anything we can do to alleviate some of that pressure um, is a valuable undertaking, but I don't think that this government has been uh, very clear about how that is actually going to play out. I mean, the fact is, uh, again, we've heard stories about uh, the the underfunding of, of legal aid and uh, cuts that this government has previously made to the Victims of Crime Fund. I mean, these are two uh, essential uh, portions of our justice system, and unfortunately, this current government has uh, continued to underfund these programs, even to the point of, uh, of uh, defense lawyers in our justice system going on strike, and I think that uh, while some of them have potentially come back to the table and, and maybe even come to some agreement, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and maybe somebody would like to correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that uh, as per an article from uh, CBA National of the Canadian Bar Association um, uh, website, nationalmagazine.ca, that they uh, have brought forward that these concerns continue uh, now and likely into the future. And so we have some major uh, problems within our justice system, and so it is uh, somewhat interesting to see uh, the priorities that this government uh, is putting forward and I would be interested to hear if there's any expectation that some of those challenges are, are going to be alleviated. But at the end of the day, when we uh, talk about the importance of, of supporting uh, justice within our legal system, uh, the idea of the continued uh, underfunding of legal aid is something that needs to be tackled and, and it's something that this government has not been able to address up to this point and it's, it's deeply uh, concerning uh, from a, a social justice and just from uh, as a, uh, a representative of my community and a citizen that wants to see everyone uh, have uh, equal representation under the law. 
Um, with that being said, just looking uh, again at this idea of moving uh, from 50,000 to a uh, maximum limit of 200,000, I am interested uh, as the uh, critic for Service Alberta and how this might affect other pieces of legislation. Of course, uh, this government uh, previously uh, made amendments to the Mobile Home Sites Tenancy Act within Bill 3 uh, in, in previous uh, uh, times in the legislature and in that uh, legislation or that amendment act it talks about the idea of this $50,000 limit which at the time was consistent uh, with what is in the legislation right now in terms of being able to uh, take this to civil courts. Now with these changes I'm just wondering if we might see changes to uh, legislation like Bill 3 and further when we talk about um, you know, tribunals within our province, uh, looking at the residential tenancy dispute resolution uh, services and the, uh, again, the tribunal opportunities there to keep these types of uh, cases out of the court system if we are going to be needing to look at uh, adjustments there, if there's any thought from the uh, uh, Minister of Service or for Service Alberta in regards to if, if the limit of 50,000 before uh, not, no longer being able to use the uh, residential tenancy dispute resolution service tribunal process if, if that is going to change at all and so uh, I would hope to hear an answer on that if there's any expectation or uh, thought around the process of potentially uh, increasing that as well. You know, just looking at the idea of the changes around the Referendum Act, I think members have uh, spoken at length on, on this piece from the opposition. And again, just looking at the amendments uh, through Bill 5 uh, regarding the refer Referendum Act with, uh, with interest. Um, you know, the, again, the Alberta.ca website talks about clarifying the requirement to bring a resolution to the legislature uh, and that it only applies to constitutional questions. Um, you know, it's, it's really, Mr. Chair, giving me flashbacks to Bill 1, which of course we weren't debating too, too long ago in this House, and the idea of this legislature now deciding what is and isn't constitutional. And of course, at the time, opposition members made it very clear that uh, we as a provincial legislature should not be making those decisions, that those should be uh, decided by our higher courts, but this government has uh, given themselves the power uh, until you know, it's potentially challenged and uh, loses or wins. I, of course, can't um, uh, try and foreshadow what might happen there or if it will happen, but this government has tried to give themselves the power to deem what is or isn't constitutional uh, within uh, the provincial legislature and within our jurisdiction. So it's interesting to see these changes around the idea of, uh, again, uh, not having to bring forward the resolution to the legislature around uh, the idea of uh, a specific referendum unless it's constitutional. And further, we have a government that is now saying we will decide what is and isn't constitutional. So I am interested to see what this government has uh, in mind for the future, if we are going to see uh, this play out and, and um, you know, what uh, pieces of, of <laughs> legislation or, or federal uh, jurisdiction this government might decide to uh, uh, try and I guess judge whether it be constitutional, constitutional or whether it uh, not be and if they try to uh, put forward a referendum um, under this amendment even if it uh, is clearly uh, cons or, uh, within the constitution or, or regarding constitution. So uh, regarding the constitution. Uh, Mr. Chair. And so there is definitely uh, questions that I continue to have uh, regarding this legislation. I think that overall there is some uh, valuable changes that are happening here in terms of uh, streamlining pieces, um, but there are uh, questions that I'm left with and so hopefully we will uh, hear from the government uh, regarding uh, potentially specific changes around uh, the uh, current limit of 50,000 going up to 200,000. Uh, the idea that this is going to reduce pressure on the courts if the uh, government is going to be providing any additional supports uh, to our lower courts um, among other things. 
And, you know, Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, uh, as previous members have said, this isn't uh, addressing many of the concerns that we uh, have uh, ongoing in Alberta regarding our health care crisis, regarding our uh, inflation crisis, and uh, the, the uh, you know, the many Albertans who find themselves struggling to make it day to day and uh, again faced with a government that is putting forward legislation that uh, in many cases is, is not going to support them. So uh, with that being said, Mr. Chair, I, I think I will take my seat and look forward to hearing uh, more debate on Bill 5. Uh, I, you know, again see pieces within this legislation that I'm happy to support, but I do have questions uh, in regards to other pieces. So with that, I'll take my seat. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. Others, I see the Honourable Member from Edmonton Castle Downs has risen. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. It's my pleasure to rise this afternoon to speak to Bill 5, the Justice Statutes Amendment Act uh, 2022. Um, you know, I've, I've been listening to debate on this and, you know, I have to agree that unfortunately uh, this government has introduced yet again another piece of legislation um, that really does nothing to to address the concerns that Albertans are being impacted by, things like health care uh, in, in a collapsing system, to be quite honest, and um, lack of affordability, which is top of mind for so many. So I just, I'm, I, I've said it over and over that on behalf of my constituents and Albertans that reach out from across the province, um, this isn't what Albertans were expecting when it came to legislation for this session. Um, there is an affordability crisis, healthcare crisis, and instead we're debating things that this government has prioritized that hasn't prioritized Albertans. Um, I have a background, uh, Mr. Chair, in working in the provincial court system and family courts um, here in Edmonton. Uh, we, we worked with family and community services um, for Edmonton and area. So uh, St. Albert, Sherwood Park, Spruce Grove, Fort Saskatchewan, um, Wetaskiwin, Leduc. Uh, and we represented, um, I represented the Director of Children's Services in provincial court. And so I have first-hand knowledge of what it's like to work in the provincial court system. Um, and I, I am in regular contact with a lot of my former colleagues, uh, whether they are um, clerks in the court, uh, lawyers, um, both on side of the Crown and on side of uh, defence. Um, many who have over the years worked with legal aid um, and many who are saying that they are no longer able to take um, new, new files. And so the court system right now as we know it is, is really struggling. There's extensive wait times um, to get a matter before a trial. Uh, if, if you're doing a, a JDR or if you're doing um, uh, mediation or any alternative to trial, um, those tend to be a little bit quicker. But when we look at what this legislation is proposing, we're looking at a increase um, in civil court, which is right now 50,000. The her government is proposing a quadruple, quadrupled rate of 200,000. So to put that in context, um, the highest rate in the province is currently 85,000. So I'm confused why uh, this government is taking a, a traditional King's Court uh, matters over 50,000 and bringing them into civil court. Um, in the provincial side when we haven't seen the government infuse supports into the provincial court system. So in essence they're taking away from King's Court and putting that burden um, onto the provincial court side without any increase of supports and resources which simply does not make sense. We have uh, legal aid lawyers um, pleading for supports and resources so that they can assist those that don't have um, the financial capacity um, that qualify for legal aid. Uh, so there's, there's many um, impacts when we're looking at 
what this piece of legislation is going to do. Uh, so for those of you that aren't quite familiar with what the provincial court currently handles, um, they, they handle the majority of criminal uh, matters, regulatory offenses, um, family and youth court, and traffic cases. That's a lot. <laughs> and so when we're looking at adding from 50,000 to 200,000, that is a significant jump in the, the types of matters that are now going to be brought forward to civ civilian court. And I, I, I just, I question where this number came from. Who was consulted to do this? Do the provincial courts um, believe that this is something that they can handle the capacity, that increase? Um, because from what I'm hearing from those that are working in the provincial court system and those that have been experienced um, individuals that have had matters before the provincial court, it is not a process that is working well right now. They are struggling. We, we need more Crown prosecutors. We need more supports for victims. We need more supports um, for people that qualify for a reduced rate through, through Alberta Legal Aid. And we're just simply not seeing that. We're not seeing the government put those supports in. So why they're increasing matters being brought forward to the provincial court without increasing the amount of supports just doesn't make sense. And it, it's going to have an impact. It's going to have a negative impact for those that deserve their right to have their matter brought before the courts in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I just, I, I question who put this number out there. It's not a number that we see anywhere else in the country. Um, it's significantly higher, and it's going to have a major, major impact. Um, I know that when I was working in the court system, um, families relied heavily on duty counsel. Um, there would be wait times um, of hours sometimes, waiting for uh, an individual to be able to speak with duty counsel. So they would come into family court, um, I was there representing the Director of Children's Services. Duty Council was there to support families that didn't have representation yet. And just for a first appearance, it was often hours of wait um, to have their matter simply brought forward to the judge and adjourned because they needed more, more time, more information, more resources. And by the time some of these matters got to the point where both sides were represented by lawyers, um, trying to plan a court date was really difficult. There wasn't a lot of uh, court time available. I, I don't know offhand what the current wait times are for court specifically, but I can imagine that um, it's not a quick turnaround from when you walk in and you're expecting to have your matter heard in a trial. Um, it is significant wait, and that's not fair to families. Um, these are matters where, where children um, oftentimes are removed from the family home and they have a right to be put forward in a, in a, in a system that um, isn't bogged down with so many different matters before the court. And so I'm curious how this government came to this decision to put these matters in, into provincial court. Um, th there are pieces of this legislation that I think are good. It looks at, uh, I believe, six different acts. And I can say that when I look at the part regarding Interjurisdictional Support Orders Act, um, th this is a good thing. When we have the capacity to bring Alberta in line with other provinces um, and expediting enforcement of child and uh, spousal support orders from other provinces, that is so important to those that uh, rely on that support and to watch families um, be delayed in receiving those supports because of a court system that isn't flowing properly. Uh, this is great news for those families that heavily rely on this support. It's often the only type of financial support that they are able to receive. So seeing that um, is a great step. And I, I am very excited that the, the children and spouses that are so reliant on this um, are gonna have an expedited process in place. When we look at the, the pieces and the sections that are, are being changed and allowed, um, it makes sense to look at how they're updating the capacity to allow for electronic and telephone transmission of documents or testimony, um, all of those different things that are bringing 
the Alberta court system in line with so many other jurisdictions that already do that. I do caution, however, that um, when I was with Children's Services in the court system, we did some of that transitioning from original legal documents um, being commissioned and sworn to electronic versions. And it was quite a, uh, a task to transition that system. Um, and that was just such a small section of the court uh, process. That was only um, the Edmonton and area courts that were doing it. It was only family and uh, children's services that was doing it. And it, it took a, quite a long time to transition in, in a way that both sides felt, or all sides, sorry, felt um, that it was effective. So um, I, I am expecting some bumps along the way, and I, I would hope that as part of this legislation, um, they are giving those additional supports that are going to be required, required by the clerks that are filing, by the, by the judges that are reviewing these documents, because it's new, it's different. Um, and it's, it's something that requires some, some patience and some understanding as that process changes. I know that there was some difficulties uh, while we were doing it with um, internet access. So some of the areas in the province didn't have reliable internet, um, and so it was sometimes quite difficult to get documents, um, alternatively, um, sworn in and presented before the courts be because of the delays with capacity, um, being able to accept a fax or a an email. Um, there are definitely some, some bumps in this process, and I hope that when the courts are coming forward and bringing forward some ideas and suggestions about what could help transition this process that this government is listening no. and providing the supports necessary to be able to implement these changes because um, it's it like I said it's coming in line with so much of uh, the the country when it comes to electronic um, testimony um, alternative ways to accept documents but it, it's just simply not uh, <laughs> not that easy. Um, there, there are definitely some growing pains in that transition, and I hope that this government is listening to, to the workers that are doing it um, and providing support necessary and patience um, when it comes to that transition. Um, the, the other piece of this legislation that uh, I think is somewhat concerning is the Referendum Act that's being impacted and allowing um, the government to make decisions um, outside of the assembly uh, regarding non-constitutional referendums. So I'm, I'm curious why this government wouldn't want to have the assembly weigh in on that. Um, it, it, uh, it doesn't sit well that we have a government that brought in um, a, a piece of legislation, Bill 1, their, their flagship bill, the Sovereignty Act, that is really going against um, so many. Uh, we've heard Treaty 6, uh, 7, and 8 come out against it. Uh, we heard them come out and say they weren't consulted, and we saw it be pushed through. Um, this gave sweeping capacity for the government to make decisions behind closed doors and without consultation. And here we are with a piece of legislation in this uh, bill looking at the Referendum Act um, and saying that it doesn't require assembly um, input. And so, again, this government is giving themselves sweeping authority to make decisions um, for non-constitutional referendums. And I, I just question what the intention is behind that and why not have the assembly weigh in? Why not bring it forward so that as members that were elected to represent my community, I can bring it back to my community and, and talk to them about what is coming forward and what their concerns are. That's what I was elected to do, uh, Mr. Chair, is to bring forward the voice of my constituents, those that I represent. Um, and again, this government is taking away the voice of Albertans. It's not just the assembly members' voices, it's not the elected officials. We're here to be the voice of those we represent. And this piece of legislation under the Referendum Act is once again taking away voice of Albertans. 
I pride myself on, on my communication and consultation that I have with, with my community. And um, I, I pride myself on being able to share their personal stories and experiences and bring forward their questions on their behalf. Uh, that was what I was elected to do, and if, if this government is making changes to that, I'm, I'm curious why. Where, where do they see the voice of those that are elected in this? Um, why are they shying away from listening to Albertans and what Albertans want? I think that we're in a place with this government where so many things are being brought forward that really don't um, address the needs and the wants of Albertans. And they're stepping further and further away from allowing Albertans to weigh in on that. And it's frightening. It, uh, it, it looks at d the democracy that we have and it is just another step of taking away the voice of so many that we represent. Um, today, I had the pleasure of having two grade six classes from Batern Elementary, which is a, a wonderful school in my community. They came here. Uh, they were um, over 70 of them. They had their teachers with them and some grown-ups that came along. And the kids were excited to, to learn about what we do. It's one thing to read about it, um, but these, these kids were just super thrilled to be able to be in this space and to watch democracy and to watch what question period looked like. Um, I had met with uh, these two classes in September during read-in week and we had some questions and answers. And at that point in the, the um, curriculum, they hadn't really learned yet about political uh, practice. And so being able to explain to them um, when they were here, it put it in context for them. And so this is a place where we want to encourage people to come and watch and listen and, and have their, their government being open and transparent to what is happening. And Bill 5, that, that piece of legislation that um, speaks to the referendum, takes away the capacity for Albertans to have some sort of experience when it comes to the legislation that's being brought forward for a referendum. And that's concerning, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chair. And I, I really don't know, you know, how to take that back to, to these students that are learning about the importance of having voice, the importance of advocacy, um, the importance of what their government should be doing. When we're debating a bill that says that it won't even make it to the chamber floor. So I, I, I just struggle with the disconnect between what this government sees their role as and what they see the role as the members of this assembly and the people that we all serve, Albertans, not being able to have voice in this place. And I think that um, there's lots that, that could be done. Um, however, not all of this piece of legislation is something that makes sense and uh, that supports Albertans. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I will um, stop my, my comments and continue to listen to debate. Um, but yeah, I hope that government is, is really paying attention and when increasing the capacity, they're supporting the capacity in, in, another, um, in another way, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honourable Member. Others wishing to ask questions or add comments? Seeing none, I'm prepared to call the question. Question on Bill Number 5, the Justice, Justice Statutes Amendment Act 2022. On the clauses of the bill, are you agreed? agreed. Opposed? Carried. On the title and preamble, are you agreed? agreed. Opposed? Carried. Shall the bill be reported? Are you agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. The members of the Committee of the Whole has under consideration Bill 7, Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022, Number 2. 
Looking for members with questions or comments. I see the Honourable Member from Edmonton Northwest. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, thanks for the opportunity to um, have uh, a couple of comments on our miscellaneous statutes um, bill for this um, session. And I mean, this is a, a common practice um, that you do group some miscellaneous statutes together and um, on a, um, a agreed upon um, between the uh, parties uh, to uh, package them so that we can help to expedite, uh, expedite um, the, them through the legislature. Um, but, you know, again, always when we exercise the miscellaneous statutes uh, agreement, I like to say from the beginning that it's always important not to abuse this or conflate it as a omnibus type of legislation where you group together um, a whole range of uh, seemingly um, unrelated um, concepts and try to pass them together as a what's called an omnibus bill. And um, I believe and always have that uh, omnibus legislation is, is dangerous and it's confusing and it doesn't help with uh, the democratic process or for the public to understand the democratic process too. And so with that being said, I mean certainly this particular version of a uh, miscellaneous statutes um, collection is um, truly is sort of a, a, a random collection in some ways. But, you know, I must say, uh, Mr. Speaker, that it's all been made necessary because of um, the way that this new government, uh, this new version of the UCP government came back together again um, after um, voting out their leader and so forth and reassembling uh, with a different cabinet and so forth. If it wasn't done in such a um, sort of haphazard and um, um, sort of uh, comically... Um, Omission, uh, you know, uh, confusing sort of way. And so, I mean, you see that built into this Miscellaneous Statutes Act, um, you know, uh, where they literally, this UCP government failed to um, cover off some of their essential duties as a government. And so needed to amend those things in this Miscellaneous Statutes so that, um, you know, they could actually cover off what a government is uh, meant to do here in the uh, province of Alberta, you know. Um, for example, there was uh, no minister responsible for the labor code or occupational health and safety. Um, there was, um, you know, um, confusion about other responsibilities in um, this cabinet, <clears throat> which is, um, I think, one of the biggest in history, if not the biggest cabinet in history, um, as one gentleman from the uh, Calgary Sun <clears throat> um, sort of uh, comically um, described it uh, that everybody's a VIP in uh, this uh, government, right? And so, you know, maybe you can take on the uh, what I saw FIFA do in, uh, when they were here in Edmonton and have a VVIP category, right? You can always say, or have a VVVIP, I suppose, category for since everyone seems to have a title over there. Um, but, um, you know, this expansion to 27 ministers, two deputy premiers, 11 parliamentary secretaries is, um, is unprecedented. And, uh, you know, and quite frankly, it has lent itself to the requirement to have so many uh, miscellaneous statutes amendments so that um, they could literally retool and reorganize um, the government, right? So I don't think it's a good way to run a uh, cabinet or to run a government, to run a railway, as they say, to uh, do this. And, um, you know, uh, Albertans have taken notice, right, that um, a government that otherwise likes to um, pride themselves in efficiency and making cuts and tough choices. I mean, um, you know, a tough choice to make everybody a cabinet minister or something, some version of a VIP is not really good uh, cricket as far as I'm concerned. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we see that this um, collection of miscellaneous uh, statutes otherwise is a lot to do with uh, the reallocation of duties and uh, trying to cover off duties that were missed and clean up this and clean up that. And um, so I guess reluctantly we have to kind of go along with it because that's what the government's supposed to do. And, uh, you know, here we are with the miscellaneous statutes trying to cover off what they forgot they were supposed to do. And so let's do it now, and uh, we will be glad to, as always, help the government out because that's what the official opposition is all about. You know, we're here to yeah. we're here help we're helpers. You know, 100%. and uh, we've got constructive criticism that uh, can make uh, life better not just for Albertans but for 
the UCP government as well. So there you go. Thanks. <clears throat> Member, others wishing to add comments or ask questions? Seeing none. I'm ready to call the question on Bill Number 7, the Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022, Number 2. On the clauses of the bill, are you agreed? agreed. Opposed? That is carried. On the title and preamble, are you agreed? agreed? Opposed? That is carried. Shall the bill be reported? Are you agreed? agreed. Opposed? Also carried. Honourable members, we're just moving right along today. This is fantastic. The Committee Whole has under consideration Bill Number 6, the Police Amendments Act 2022. Any members wishing to add comments, questions, or amendments to this bill? Bill 6, yes. Okay. I see the Honourable Member for Calgary, Boulder McCall. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, and I rise to speak to uh, Bill 6, and I do have an amendment to move, so I will uh, let the pages distribute that. I will read that amendment into record, and then... Thank you. ...will deliver some remarks. Just give us a moment, and then I'll have you read the amendment into the record. This is Amendment A1. I'd ask the Honourable Member from Buller McCall, Calgary Buller McCall, to read it into the record, please. <coughs> Member from Calgary McCall to move that Bill 6, Police Amendment Act 2022, be amended in Section 4 in the proposed Section 1.1 by adding the following after Clause E. E.1 It is desirable that policing services be provided in a manner that recognizes the importance of intersectionality anti-racism and trauma-informed practice as critical analytical framework for meeting the diverse need of individual and communities in Alberta. So in this bill, uh, government and the section four enshrine some guiding principles that policing in Alberta should be uh, conducted in accordance with the principle that are enshrined in Section 4 of the legislation that one, policing to make sure that they protect the safety and security uh, of all persons, they respect their fundamental rights, charter, Charter of Rights, listed in Charter of Rights and Freedom, and they should cooperate uh, with the members of the communities they serve, and they asked that policing should take into account health-related situation uh, affecting individuals mental health, and police should promote culture of accountability and be transparent. So these are all uh, good principles, and I do agree with it. And what this uh, clause will do, that this clause will enshrine an additional principle to that list and reason for that is that as is stated that uh, police should respond uh, to the needs of Albertans 
uh, it should reflect the diversity of Albertans. And we do know that uh, Albertans come from many different uh, backgrounds, many different cultures, many different uh, talents. And we have a huge diversity in our province. And seeing things through the lens of intersectionality, uh, that will give us a better understanding of who we are as society, uh, what the makeup is of our society that will help us acknowledge our differences better and that will also uh, guide public policy responses that we uh, formulate as a result of such analysis of intersectionality. And why it's important? Uh, lately, in particular, we uh, have seen uh, tragedies in the United States which uh, receive huge media attention, in particular uh, the, the murder of George Floyd. And then we have also uh, seen tragedies here in Alberta as well how uh, a person from South Sudan was killed in Calgary. We have also heard uh, concerns from our indigenous communities. They certainly have long-standing uh, grievances about uh, policing in this province. And when we look at uh, stats about uh, representation of indigenous communities, uh, other person of color communities in our justice system, we do know that indigenous uh, communities are overrepresented in our justice system. They are disproportionately incarcerated in our remand centers and penitentiaries. So this principle will make sure that we take into account uh, intersectionality of gender, race, and all other relevant factors, and try to understand uh, over differences, try to understand a uh, problem more holistically, and come up with public policy responses in a much, much better way. Similarly, uh, it will enshrine anti-racism uh, as a principle in the legislation. Again, we do know that Alberta is make up of people of many different uh, backgrounds, and there have been concerns raised by person of color communities, how they are treated uh, by the law enforcement in this province, in this country, and I think having that enshrined as a principle uh, will also uh, help us make policing better in our province earlier. We also uh, tried to bring forward a piece of legislation that would have asked this government to collect race-based data so that we can see uh, the extent of these issues that exist in our system. Unfortunately, that bill didn't pass. But again, now, with this legislation, we have that opportunity that we have explicitly uh, written in legislation that policing will be uh, guided by the principles of anti-racism. Then it also enshrines uh, that trauma-informed practice that should be part of all delivery of public service. We do know that, in particular, our indigenous communities, they have been through a lot. They have been through residential schools. There has been cultural genocide, 60s school, and there are still uh, impacts 
of that drama that can be seen from generation to generation. We have enough evidence that such drama that is uh, endured by indigenous communities like a few decades ago that can still manifest itself in their uh, current generations. So it's more important than ever before that when we know that such drama uh, can be seen in their generation today, that we inform our policies, our services, be that police service, be that any other government program, with a lens that it's drama informed. So this principle, I think, will uh, do a few things. One, that it will send a strong message uh, from the government of Alberta to indigenous communities, to person of color communities, that the government recognizes uh, their concern, government is listening to their concerns, and they are enshrining uh, these key principles in the legislation that will guide the policing in our province. Second thing is that this will also help us address the concern, gauge the concerns of systemic racism in our uh, law enforcement. There are those concerns. Those concerns uh, need to be heard. And I think one way of doing that is that we guide our policing through the lens of intersectionality, anti-racism, and trauma-informed practice. This will uh, help us make or law enforcement better. This will help us uh, instill trust and confidence of Albertans in our law enforcement, in particular those from indigenous communities, those from person of color communities. So I think it's a very uh, common sense, uh, straightforward, amendment and we can all agree that police services exist to serve uh, people of Alberta. They should be trained in diversity. They should be trained in principles of intersectionality. They should be analyzed in those differences that exist and be able to tailor their response to respond to the needs of Alberta society as it exists today. So this principle, these principles, will serve as the cornerstone for our uh, policing going forward and help us with community safety and address the concerns that indigenous communities, that black communities, person of color communities, racialized communities have in relation to policing. We have shared uh, the comment in this amendment in advance uh, with the minister uh, for minister's cons consideration and I look forward to hearing from the government side what they think of this amendment. Thank you and with that I will take my seat. Thank you honorable member. Honourable members, we are on Amendment A1 as moved by the Honourable Member from Calgary, Buller McCall. Others looking to add to debate. I see the Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, look, when it comes to uh, this amendment that's been proposed by the NDP, we encourage police services to include these principles in their diversity and in inclusion plans or their community safety plans. Uh, police services already have this as part of their HR practices and uh, these are, are principles that guide uh, recruiting um, and, and employee expectations. And the ministry does in fact also offer training for police services which would cover some of the points in this uh, proposed amendment. So thank you Mr. Chair. Others, I see the honorable member from Edmonton Ellerslie has risen. Thank you very much Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to stand up and overwhelmingly support this particular amendment. And, you know, I think that uh, 
the member from Calgary, Buller McCall, has um, stated explicitly why it's so important that this particular amendment be accepted by the government, by uh, all members of the legislature, in making sure that uh, it is incorporated into the Police Amendment Act. And I can't tell you the number of times that I hear from multiple communities, not just one in particular, um, that they do not feel that policing services in the province of Alberta are sensitive. I guess that's the best word I could use. Sensitive to the issues being uh, brought up in this particular amendment. So I want to thank the member from Calgary, Buller McCall, uh, when he when he brings this amendment that wants to focus on intersectionality, anti-racism, and trauma-informed practice, and including that in the framework. Now, we have seen that in order to address these issues, you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. And that's all that we're asking. Now, I know that it has been suggested it has been encouraged. But if we bring it and we actually amend the piece of legislation before us, then this would uh, include uh, a level of intentionality that at this level, at the level of the legislature, we would like to be incorporated into the Police Amendment Act. Now, all we need to do is look at Alberta history. Why is it that Indigenous people are overrepresented in our justice system? And it has to do with our track record of colonialism. When you look at, at a situation, and, and not only that, Mr. Chair, but you know the, the greater injustice here, in my personal opinion, is the fact that it's not only just Indigenous people that are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, but it's actually a greater percentage of them are women when compared to the general population. Now, I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head right now, but uh, I have quoted them uh, in the legislature before. But they're as high as 30%, if I'm not mistaken, in, in some cases, when Indigenous people only make up 3% of the Canadian population. Now this, you have to ask yourself, why does, why is this the tendency? Now when you look at the, the legacy of colonialism in the province of Alberta and throughout Canada and throughout the world, and how indigenous people have been treated by policing structures, and how they feel targeted by by the policing services. It is, and, and this is where, where the trauma-informed goes to, Mr. Chair. Trauma-informed. And we cannot continue to expect this to change unless we're intentional about, about actually bringing trauma-informed perspectives into the understanding of policing and the relationship that exists between police and the communities that they are there to serve. We need this intersectionality. We need the, the training in anti-racism. We need the training in, in trauma-informed practice so that we can get this right. It's a huge injustice that that, that over-representation of Indigenous people uh, in, in our in our prisons, at both the provincial and at the federal level. And it's something that I've called uh, the legislature's attention to before a number of times. But you know, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Chair, it's not surprising when we hear from uh, Alberta chiefs of First Nations communities stating publicly that the premier of the current government 
doesn't even understand the treaty relationship. This is not coming from my mouth, Mr. Chair. This is coming from one of the chiefs of the First Nations here in Alberta. If you, if you don't even understand the treaty relationship that exists between nation to nation of, of indigenous communities here, how can we expect you to, or people in general, and I'm not pointing any fingers, how can we expect people to then understand the trauma-informed practice as it relates to indigenous people and, their, and the legacy of colonialism that exists here in the province of Alberta? You need to be intentional about this, right? I see some, some shaking heads over here that just, just don't get it. It's very important. It's very important that we recognize, number one, that we're all treaty people. And on top of that, that there are specific calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when it comes to the gross injustices that have occurred here in the province of Alberta and throughout Canada with a legacy of colonialism. How can we ever expect to get it right if we're not going to, number one, accept the truth of what has happened? I mean, that's the whole, pro that's the whole uh, intention between truth and reconciliation. First, you've got to accept the truth the historical truth that, 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 that occurred, the injustices that occurred. And then only from then being able to understand that can then we then uh, actually hope to get it right. And that's why this amendment is so important, specifically when it comes to Indigenous people, but not only Indigenous people, Mr. Chair. Over the last several months, we know that black, hijabi, Muslim women have been attacked here in the province of Alberta, specifically here in the city of Edmonton. And one of the very first cases, Mr. Chair, the woman that was attacked, when she went to go report what had happened to her, she felt grossly mistreated by the officer that was taking her report. This, was what, this is common knowledge. It was actually reported. It was in the papers. So here we have an instance where someone from a racialized background is saying, I don't even feel comfortable reporting the gross injustice that happened to me, the hate crime that happened to me, the violation that happened to me to a police officer so that, and trusting that the system, the policing service system, is going to be able to actually get this right and actually be able to correct the injustice that occurred. So you see how important it is that this not be left to voluntary, uh, well, it's nice if it happens. No, we have to be intentional about it. And that's why this amendment is so important. You know, I would have liked to see the Minister of Justice to get up and actually support this amendment. Instead of saying, oh yeah, we encourage policing services to do this. This is an opportunity for all of us here in this legislature to make sure that every Albertan feels that the policing services that are being provided in this province are going to respect them, are going to be able to help them feel that they are being listened to, because the officers, whoever they may be, and I'm not trying to point fingers at any one or another, it's not, that's not the point here, is that every officer will have the knowledge because we've been intentional about them receiving education when it comes to intersectionality, when it comes to anti-racism, and when it comes to trauma-informed practice and understanding a, a historical, having a historical perspective when it comes to injustices that have happened in the past.
I'm not trying to shame or blame anybody here. That's not what this is about. And I hope that the members on the other side of the house aren't misconstruing that the, my statements and that being the case, because that's not what this is about. This is about trying to build a better Alberta, Mr. Chair. A better Alberta where people, when they've had an injustice or a violation happen to them, feeling comfortable enough to go to the services and the individuals represented by those institutions and that they'll actually be listened to and understood. That's what this is about. The black hijabi Muslim sisters who unfortunately had to go through all that trauma want the policing services and the individuals of those institutions to understand, at bare minimum to understand, okay, well, living your life as a black hijabi Muslim woman here in the province of Alberta, you are going to feel different. It's not the same when you're, when you're, when you, you have a, a whole, and, and Mr. Chair, it's been well documented, where you have like a whole industry of Islam, creating more and more Islamophobia. T misconstruing, taking misconceptions about Islam and reinforcing them and sharing them as propaganda through, the, through social media. It's well known that here in, the, in Canada, we have over 3,000, I want to be careful with the words that I choose, Mr. Chair, but from my understanding, if I'm not mistaken, we have over 3,000 white nationalist social media, either websites or social, or social media pages, from my understanding, in the last report that I read. More than 3,000 of them, Mr. Chair, that take these misconceptions about, in this particular case, I'm talking about Islam, and then f add fuel to the fire and go out there and try to misinform other Albertans about Islam. And it doesn't happen just with Islam, uh, Mr. Chair, as you well know. It happens with anti-Semitism. It happens with the, the Jewish community. We've seen all kinds of places of worship being attacked. And, and I will say that, you know, having, uh, providing a grant for places of worship to put up security cameras or, or, or whatever they deem necessary in order to protect their places of worship was a good step on behalf of the government. But notice that we still have this incredible problem of people being attacked on the streets of this province, in cities, where a grant to a place of worship is not enough. And we need to put uh, our priorities in line with this particular problem. And at the root of it is people feeling safe enough to go to the institutions that are supposed to be there to protect them and serve them and make them feel safe in their community and that these, the individuals who make up those institutions are going to be informed and at least bare minimum, not necessarily understand what it's like for uh, a black hijabi Muslim sister, but at least know that there's a difference between what she is experiencing on the streets of Alberta and someone who is not identifying of the same way. And that's what this is about, Mr. Chair. To be able to understand that we need to be sensitive to the experiences of others. 
And I get it, you know, like people talk about cancel culture, or you can't say this, and you can't say that. And you know what? It's a sign of respect. It's me telling the rest of the world that I'm not going to use offensive language or sexist language or whatever the case may be because I respect other Albertans who identify in another way. That's all it is. Nothing difficult about it. And I believe that it's so important that in this case we're talking about policing services. And you've, I'm sure that you've heard me get up in this house before, Mr. Chair, through you to all the members here, and, and talk about how important it is that we be sensitive to this in all of our institutions. That we need to decolonize all our institutions. Not just the policing services, but in this particular instance, we're here talking about this amendment, which is being intentional about including anti-racism, intersectionality, and trauma-informed practice to the policing service. And, you know, if the members on the other side of the house could get up and give me an actual, concrete, rational argument about why this shouldn't be done, I would like to hear it. This, it doesn't seem like, like something that far of a stretch for us to actually include in legislation. I don't understand why you would be against something like this. Why you would be against this amendment. And to get up, and for the Minister of Justice, and uh, the individual himself, to get up and say, well, well, we're already asking them to voluntarily do this. It's up to them if they want to do it or not. That's not enough. And guess what? It's not enough for Albertans. It's not enough for the Albertans in this province that feel unsafe walking through the streets of their cities and other municipalities throughout this province. And it's not fair, Mr. Chair. Because here's an opportunity for this legislature to go above and beyond and make a change that will drastically make difference, make a huge difference for a lot of people of racialized people, indigenous people. This will make a huge difference for them to feel more safe on our streets and in our communities. So I can't fathom why the members on the other side won't, won't vote for this amendment. Like, has the level of partisanship come to that degree where we're talking, and we're talking about 30% of the population. 30% of the, last I checked, 30% of the, of the Alberta population, Mr. Chair, is ethnically diverse. 30%. So we're talking about 30% of Albertans that this would actually go to serve and all it's doing is saying, look, institutions, provide, be intentional about providing intersectionality, anti-racism, and trauma-informed education to uh, the individuals that make up your institution so that they can be better informed about how to help and serve the Alberta public, of which 30% will be impacted. We'll feel safer. We'll feel listened to. We'll feel understood. So I challenge the members on the other side of the house. Get up and give me a good reason why this amendment shouldn't be passed in this house right now. I'm asking them. Legitimately, I'm asking, give me a good reason why, or else the only thing that I can blame it on is the fact that we've, we've gone so far down. Thank you, Honourable Member. Other members wishing to speak to Amendment A1. The Honourable Member for Edmonton-Rutherford. 
has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this amendment on uh, Bill 6. I had the opportunity to speak to Bill 6, and as I indicated yesterday, I certainly have some aspects of Bill 6 that I wish to support. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, hopefully we'll see some of that move forward, although I've ex also expressed my concerns. But it's nice to be able to just stand up and talk about something that I think would really improve the bill, help move things along, doesn't detract from any of the intentions uh, that have been described by uh, the minister. I took a little bit of time to review uh, Hansard records uh, on this from yesterday and listen to um, the um, member from um, Leduc Beaumont um, as they uh, as they talked about the bill and 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 quite. Uh, rightly talked about how important policing is and thank the police officers in our uh, in our system for the work that they do and I certainly agree with all of that uh, so I don't think we're in a, in a an antagonistic place here I um, certainly have worked with police officers quite regularly in my career as a social worker with a specialization in the area of family violence um, I worked with uh, police officers uh, in the child welfare system. I worked with police officers when I was at Catholic Social Services um, uh, through our elder abuse uh, program. And uh, it certainly found that when we worked together, we, we got great things done. And we dealt with some of the very darkest things that happen in society. Um, you know, we had to deal with people that were abusing their children, or abusing their elders. Um, we had to, to do that from a, a place of... Um, of clarity as to um, what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior, but we also had to do that from a place of compassion, knowing that people who are in the position of, of um, uh, becoming offenders are often there for very specific reasons um, in their own life, uh, often related to their own experiences of trauma, often related to their own experiences of racism, often related to uh, um, their own um, uh, lack of receiving compassion throughout their lives. And so it means that the time of the police intervention, it's very important that that uh, work be informed by uh, an understanding of the circumstances. Uh, there was a study done on one of the jails in the Edmonton area a little while ago now, I guess I've, I've been out of the academic field for a while, so it's a, little, it's a bit of an age study, but it was very interesting because what they did is they did an, an examination of everybody in the um, jail system and came back with the determination that upwards of 80% of the people in jail uh, demonstrated some level of involvement with FASD, fetal alcohol syndrome uh, disorder. Uh, and, uh, and, I, um, and I think that that's very telling because what it tells us is that it wasn't simply an issue of people making bad choices and uh, people, um, uh, you know, who were committing acts out of greed or, or uh, other kinds of uh, self-indulgence, but rather that people were committing uh, many of these illegal acts because of their inability to act in an appropriate way, because of their inability to make good judgments. Uh, because of the uh, consequence of many of the negative things that had happened to them in their own lives. And the more we understand that, the more likely we are to be able to intervene and to make changes in, in, in the criminal's life and hopefully, therefore, in the lives of uh, all of the, the current and potential victims. Um, and so I think it's very important that we move policing in, a, in an appropriate direction. And I certainly found, when I worked with the police officers, that they understood this. Uh, they weren't antagonistic to this notion that, that we can do it better, and that we can do it better by understanding the social circumstance of the people we're dealing with, and to construct interventions that are reflective of what we know about their circumstances, about their abilities, about... Um, about their traumas. And having done that, that we can reduce the amount of, uh, of conflict that we have, uh, not only in society, but conflict with the policing services themselves when they're out on the street, because I certainly don't want to see police officers in the position where their lives are threatened or their well-being is, is under assault. Um, 
And uh, so if we can find a way to intervene with people that, that isn't about, you know, having more firepower than, than the offender, because that always leads to a clash of, of firepower. And that means that the, the uh, outcome is often one that's tragic, not only for the people who are, are the, um, um, the suspects or the, or the criminals involved, but often, far too often, for the public servants that are involved. And, I, and so I think it's very important that we, we, uh, we think very seriously about this issue. Now, I know that there's a bit of a trend in the United States, particularly uh, of, of sort of the militarization of police, you know, bigger weapons, even bringing in armored cars and so on. And I think that's a terrible, tragic mistake. I think it's a, a, a failure to understand that you can resolve the issues without always coming in with more weaponry and uh, m more uh, focus on the violent aspect of the interaction. And I know that's true because as a social worker, when I was working for child welfare, I you know, frequently went into people's homes uh, as an individual, one, a sole person. And the people in these homes are often people with significant records, uh, often involvement with gangs. And I would go in without arms um, and without violence and sometimes have to apprehend and remove their children. All of this was done without any violence. All of this was done without uh, getting to a place of, um, of forcing myself upon the family, but just simply using the authority invested in me by the legislature uh, in the ch under the Child Welfare Act. And it, it, it told me that we could work with people no matter how much they were in conflict with the law, but we could work with people in such a way that we could come to a better resolution, even when we had to do things that they were unhappy with, like remove their children from their care. And this happens thousands of times every year by child, uh, child welfare workers who engage people who would otherwise be considered somewhat dangerous in other circumstances, very often. But the fact that we made the decision not to go in from a militaristic perspective but rather from a socially informed perspective, we were able to achieve, I think, better outcomes. Now, we certainly think a lot needs to be done to, to, um, uh, to, to work on those kinds of interventions so that we get better at them. This is something we're just learning about now in the history of, of intervention. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that... Uh, uh, you know, we have to give some patience for um, policing services and, and their um, affiliated support workers, like social workers, to figure out how to move forward on this. But one way that we can do that is we can put into this bill a request, as um, um, the member from uh, Buller McCall has, has uh, indicated, that the uh, services that are provided recognize the importance of some of the social things, such as intersectionality, anti-racism, and trauma-informed practice. Uh, this, this doesn't change the nature of the bill. It simply asks us to be supportive, to encourage police forces and their, their allies to think about ways that they can go about doing things, to resist the Americanization and weaponization of the police forces, and instead to go to um, uh, a... a set of interventions that are uh, well-informed, that are uh, based on good science and good research, and that have outcomes that are more desirable both for the offenders and for the police services themselves. Now, I must say that I was disappointed earlier in the year when we made recommendations that race-based data be collected so that we can ensure that, um, uh, that our institutions themselves are not uh, uh, causing some of the trauma that uh, leads to negative outcomes. And I was very disappointed when, when we introduced that as a, as a possibility here in the House and the government uh, voted against it. Uh, and so I'm asking them now not to go down that same route. Uh, this bill does not uh, change what it is that you're wanting to do. It, 
merely, uh, this amendment, excuse me, this amendment merely adds to it, gives us something more. It, uh, it makes the, the bill itself more robust in its uh, uh, framing of the work that needs to be done in the community. So I think it's a good, a good chance for the government to say, you know what, reasonable amendment, let's go with it. And let's, uh, let's uh, you know, work cooperatively across the floor to uh, create an outcome that will be desirable for everyone involved. And, you know, they could uh, include, uh, you know, some very specific directives like race-based data. I would certainly have liked to have, to have seen that happen here. But given that they're not prepared to go that far, perhaps they're just prepared to go as far as to suggest uh, that... Uh, be that the policing services be provided in a manner that recognizes intersectionality, anti-racism, trauma-informed practice. So it's not a directive. It's a suggestion. It's, a, it's a, an establishment of a, of a, of a, a tone, of a, a manner of policing that we would like to see. Because I think that if we do that, that we will be able to reduce criminality in our society because it, we begin to intervene in ways that address the underlying issues that lead to criminality. And, and I think it's really important that we do that. It, it's, it's quite easy for us to just sort of say bad guys are bad guys and therefore they should be punished. I think it's, it's, it's better for us as a society to say these people have done bad things. But if we understand how it is that they arrived at the place where they've done bad things, then we can actually make the changes that are necessary. And those changes may not even be with the individual. They may be with society. They may be a society that is racist. They may be with a society that, uh, that has too much alcohol uh, being used inappropriately. It may be with a society that allows a, a deep poverty amongst wealth. There are lots of social reasons why um, negative things happen in our society. And if we take responsibility for our part of it, and then we assist and help uh, members uh, of our community to do that as well, then we're likely to see some serious improvements in terms of the outcomes. And hopefully that means some desirable things for us. That means that we have fewer people in jail and save a lot of money when we do that. We have fewer people committing crimes, and we save a lot of money from that. We have fewer people ending up in hospitals from fights and, and conflicts and, uh, and uh, you know, assaults and so on. And as a result, we save a lot of money. There is a lot of money to be saved in policing if we do policing in a way that actually leads to reducing the underlying causes of criminality rather than putting more and more money into the notion that somehow we just have to be bigger, badder, more militaristic in our policing style. It's not necessary. I certainly, as I said, have worked with many police officers who get this and who demonstrate exceptional skills in this area. That they, quite are, they are quite able to enter into a situation and employ these social skills and come out with everybody being okay because they have understood what it is that they're, that they're trying to do in their interventions. They didn't just go in saying, I'm in charge, I get, to I get to decide what happens, and if you resist me, I'm going to beat you up. They don't do that because they're skilled police officers. They're officers who understand that there are a number of ways to intervene. Some of them accelerate the chaos. Some of them increase the conflict, and others decrease the conflict and decrease the chaos. And so here it is. Here's a chance for us to say, look, we know some of the ways that we can decrease chaos in our society. We know that if we understand issues like intersectionality, if we understand issues like racism, we understand issues like trauma, we can actually change our behavior, we can change our, our social constructs, and we can change our interventions. And then we can, in doing that, we can invite the citizens who are in conflict with the law to also change their circumstances so that they're less likely to find themselves in a place of conflict with the law. That seems like a pretty desirable outcome to me. And uh, this, this bill does it, uh, this amendment to the bill does it in a very nice way. 
it just simply invites the, uh, the, the services to think about this and to create a circumstance where uh, the opportunity to learn about this and to employ these kind of effective skill sets um, uh, will, will be uh, uh, it will be done on a, on a consistent basis and on a provincial wide basis because every police service will have the same kind of mandate to do these kinds of things. And there's nothing terribly foreign about this to the police services I've worked with. Certainly many of the police officers I've worked with can articulate these things much better than I can. I can tell you about how they have found ways to intervene that did not lead to violence. Uh, you know, when, when somebody is kidnapped in our society, for example, they don't always just bring in the guns, they bring in a negotiator. They bring in somebody who actually has learned the set of social skills that is likely to lead to the kidnapping to be resolved in a positive way where neither the victim nor the perpetrator's lives are forfeited. And so the police officers know how to do this kind of work. And I think most of them would welcome doing this kind of work. And unfortunately, there is a trend, I think, coming largely from the states going in the opposite direction. And I think it's, it's a good chance for us to say, not here, not in Alberta. We don't want to move in that particular direction. We want to move in a positive, progressive direction. We want to create a society in which everyone is treated responsibly and respectfully by the services that we have. In the same way that we would ask that of healthcare or social services, we, we can ask that of policing. And I expect that we will, we will be very happy with the outcome if we indeed see police services being set up around this kind of agenda, rather than an agenda of power and control over citizens, which is not a very protect, productive agenda. And I don't, don't think that our police services uh, are asking for that. I'm worried about the trend as I see from the states. But I think that, that uh, we need to be really clear where we stand on this. And we stand in a place that says all citizens are worth recovering. All citizens are worth inviting back into the fold, no matter what kind of activities they've been engaged in. And that we can do that by having intervention services that are focused on the structural reasons why people are outside of the fold. The drivers that have pulled them out of being good citizens. So uh, I'll finish my comments by saying that I appreciate uh, the government's uh, bringing forward this bill. Uh, although I've had some concerns about it, I see some potential here. Uh, I certainly like the um, uh, the emphasis on, on citizen involvement and citizen review, the, some of the changes to ACER and so on, and I think that this amendment fits right into that, is really consistent with that, and uh, will allow us to, um, uh, to feel like we've had a, a, a fulsome um, discussion of what it is that we want to see in our police forces, and, and will invite a, uh, a, a new pattern in society that's citizen-based and uh, positive outcome-based. It's not about control, it's not about containment of people, it's about inviting people to become uh, participants in our society in a positive way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Member. Others wishing to speak to Amendments A1, I see the Honourable Member for Calgary Glenmore has risen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I rise today to speak uh, uh, on this amendment, and I want to um, commend the, the members opposite for, for raising these issues, and I think that everyone in this chamber would agree uh, that anti-racism, trauma-informed practice, understanding the diversity of the people of Alberta is incredibly important. Um, I know that I've been personally blessed to be able to work on a number of issues uh, in my time as an elected official. I've worked with the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Joint Working Group, where indeed we undertook um, lengthy conversation, lengthy research, in-depth uh, thought and, and debate 
to produce certainly the joint uh, working group report and um, we had an, an emphasis throughout all of our discussions certainly on anti-racism but definitely on trauma-informed practices we also see I see at any rate uh, across our province police forces are are changing they have been changing for years um, the police services um, that came in, in front of us in fact for the the joint working group um, we had we had Aboriginal police forces we had um, city police forces we had RCMP come before us to to have conversations on how policing is done and anti-racism trauma for practices uh, looking at uh, uh, disaggregated data certainly also important I will say this I have seen a great deal of change in policing I, I look to uh, police chief uh, McPhee for instance and the work that he's done in the city of Edmonton and I don't think there's anybody in this chamber who could say that uh, Chief McPhee uh, and his police force don't understand these concepts and so I recognize the sentiment behind this amendment and why it was brought forth but frankly I, I think that this amendment uh, at this point our police forces have this have this uh, in their minds at all times in my view I think they work every day with these uh, with these values as, as a premise to their work and so I'm not sure that we need an amendment to although I understand the sentiment and I appreciate the sentiment I'm not sure that this amendment is necessary for this legislation and um, I, I just want to say that I appreciate our police officers out there who are doing good work every day to make sure that diversity and inclusion is part of their everyday work making sure that uh, trauma-informed practice is occurring every single day um, and that anti-racism is something that we all take seriously and our police forces take seriously I think that I think that goes without saying our police forces understand anti-racism and they undertake it every day and so um, I would say that this while the sentiment behind it is commendable I think that this um, amendment is extraneous to what we're trying to get done with this bill today and I think uh, we can uh, I think the bill uh, proceeds nicely without any amendments um, and I'll just leave it at that thank you mr. speaker Thank you. Other members wishing to speak to Amendment A1, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs. Um, Mr. Chair, um, I rise to speak to the amendment uh, regarding the Bill 6 Police Amendment Act. And I, I want it read in the record what we're asking, um, especially after the, the previous speaker and uh, their comments um, it, I just I, I can't believe some of the things that come out of this chamber but I mean those those comments were so tone deaf to what is happening in our province in regards to the treatment of Albertans and to say that you know this this legis this amendment is is wonderful and um, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, just throws in the face of so many individuals, uh, their experience. Um, Mr. Chair, what, what we're proposing, what we're asking this assembly to do is the Police Amendment Act 2022 be amended in Section 4 in the proposed Section 1.1 by adding the following after Clause E. e Point one, it is desirable that policing services be provided in a manner that recognizes the importance of intersectionality, anti-racism, and trauma-informed practice as critical analytical frameworks for meeting the diverse needs of individuals and communities in Alberta. This is essential when it comes to an expectation of the police force and those that they serve that is represent rep representative of Albertans we have a very very diverse province 
we have experiences that we have all heard firsthand, we've witnessed in the news, we've heard heartbreaking stories of racism, of systemic racism, not just from individual officers, but from the system itself. And to ask that this be included, um, but to have members of government say, yes, this is important and it's already done, completely minimizes the experiences that so many in Alberta are experiencing. We have a society that needs to do better, needs to come from a place of understanding. And when we're asking for a, a, a amendment to include these strong needs, intersectionality, anti-racism, trauma-informed practice. I think those are key guiding principles that should be enshrined in the Police Act. And it would enhance what this government is trying to do in Bill 6. And I think by, by standing up and saying, yes, it's important, but we're not going to support it, tells a really strong story to those that are experiencing trauma, that it's not important enough to put it in writing to make it part of the guiding principles. That to me, Mr. Chair, is, is very telling. When we have the responsibility in this chamber to make sure that we are, are putting forward legislation that takes into account the human experience of so many we need to take action and do something that not only acknowledges that experience, but puts real language to what the expectation is. I've worked alongside police for, for most of my career in social work, whether I was working in the school system, working in group care, working in children's services, as a family support worker, we relied heavily on the support of the police. Sometimes it was in awful circumstances where we needed police assistance to come in and to, to help. And I can tell you that there's so much work that can be done. And so many officers that I've spoke to when working with children's services, have expressed a desire to understand and to learn more. But if that isn't an expectation or training for police, how can that come to place? You have to have legislation that supports this as part of the practice. You can't sit in this chamber and say it's already happening. Because we're talking to Albertans. We hear those horrific stories of mistreatment. To say that it's done in recruiting is enough? That's not enough. I've sat in training sessions with uh, EPS in children's services to go through sexual assault training and to assist with police members in understanding how to take a disclosure of sexual assault from a, from a child. And the interest of those members, they had to personally sign up for that. And so often they had shared that they wished that that was something that was just part of their job. This gives the government an opportunity to highlight the importance and to take action into supporting our police in getting the critical analytical framework that they need to properly and effectively and compassionately support Albertans. You, you, you do what you know until you know better. And this is a wonderful opportunity to provide some, some very specific language that enhances the guiding principles of our, our police Amendment Act, and I think that by 
by encouraging their members to vote it down is a detriment to what the, they're claiming this act is intended to do. I think when we talk about anti-racism and trauma-informed practice, it's essential that those serving Albertans, the first responders, they have an understanding of what those individuals experience is. To show up at a call with that deep understanding of what it means to have a trauma-informed practice is so essential. I know through social work over the years, as we learned better, we did better. We come from a place of truly wanting to serve and help, but if you don't have all the tools necessary, perhaps you're not able to do your best work. And I, I just, I'm, I'm baffled that this government sits here and says, it, it's already done. It's, it's good enough the way it is. We don't need to put that language in there. Well, that's the whole purpose of opening up the act, is to be able to listen to the, the, the true life experience of Albertans and to make sure that it is part of that act and that we have guiding principles that really meet the needs of individuals and communities in the province of Alberta. And with that, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chair, I hope that everybody in the chamber supports this amendment. It, it doesn't take away anything. It adds incredible uh, support and, and value to what this piece of legislation is intending to do. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. Others wishing to speak to Amendment A-1, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Beverly Clearview has the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. It's my pleasure to rise and uh, speak to the amendment on, on Bill 6. <clears throat> and I appreciate the comments that uh, my colleagues have made so far on this. I think, you know, first and foremost, the, the Minister of Justice and uh, the member, I believe, from Calgary, Glenmore, both spoke about the, the in their opinion, this amendment is not necessary, and, and I strongly disagree. I mean, I'll start off by saying, first of all, we're adding a guiding principle. Um, there are other guiding principles that um, I, I, I think augment uh, this bill. The fact that we're talking about acknowledging the history and culture of Indigenous peoples. We're talking about... Um, the fact that police services should strive to reflect the pluralistic character of society and the communities they serve, uh, that they should promote a culture of accountability. This is a guiding principle. And, and you know, earlier I, I listened to the Minister of Justice talk about the fact that um, police already do this. Well, if they do this, then let's codify it in legislation then there shouldn't be a resistance to it. This isn't adding more work. This isn't adding red tape. This is augmenting uh, a guiding principle. And from my experiences, uh, I could tell you, Mr. Chair, that, that there are some uh, officers who are asking for this, who are looking for more training, are looking, um, you know, because they recognize that the communities that they serve are increasingly diverse. Now, before I, I, I dive into this further, I, I do want to take a moment, as I, as I foreshadowed earlier this afternoon, um, that I want to take a moment to recognize the outstanding work that uh, our men and women uh, do um, to serve and, and protect. And... I am uh, firmly in the belief, Mr. Chair, that uh, the men and women who serve in our police force uh, in Edmonton's Northeast are the best of the best. And I was at an event uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Mr. Chair, where um, it's the Fort Road, it's the annual Fort Road AGM. And so the Fort Road... Uh, BIA, Business Improvement Area. And I got to tell you, Mr. Chair, that every year, not only do our BEAT officers come to uh, this event, we get 
um, all of the senior officers from the Northeast Division uh, that attend. And this year, uh, being my final um, time to, to speak at this event as an MLA, it was back in October, I took, uh, you know, an extra couple of moments to recognize the incredible uh, contributions that uh, EPS has made to improve the lives of so many um, constituents in my riding. And the fact that the Northeast Division has a stellar reputation for building relationships with community members. They are active in the community. They turn up to every single community event, whether we're flipping pancakes or we're at um, the farmer's market or we're participating in a parade um, or we're doing a cleanup. Uh, you know, EPS in, in Northeast um, are absolutely outstanding. And an example of that, one uh, retired superintendent, a retired superintendent, showed up again this year because he is so committed to the community. Um, Tom is his name, and I gave him a shout out. Uh, one of the nicest human beings you will ever meet. Um, and, and a great leader and has accomplished so much uh, for not only Northeast, but for, for all of Edmonton and, and Alberta. Uh, as well, uh, Randy, one of our, our, our beat officers who's been in the Northeast forever, uh, got moved to uh, another division, but, but still showed up to show his support. And, and we had, honestly, probably around 10 EPS officers that attended by choice, not because they had to, because they are so involved in the community and part of the community. And I, I, I thank them um, on behalf of, of all members of the Legislative Assembly, um, thank them for their service, uh, because they truly do make uh, our community a better place and, uh, and do it from a, a, a place of, of humility um, and sincerity. And so, uh, you know, with that, Mr. Chair, they want to find ways to enhance the work that they're doing. They want to provide an even better level of service for the community. And so this amendment that my colleague, the, the justice critic, has put forward has will augment the work that they're doing. All what this is asking, I mean, this isn't even requiring additional training. This is simply recognizing the importance of intersectionality, of anti-racism, and trauma-informed practices. I, every time I listen to my colleague, the member for Edmonton Rutherford, uh, speak about his experiences as a social worker, likewise my colleague, the member for Edmonton Castledowns, I learn something new about uh, their perspective, but also, you know, the incredible service that they gave to our city and their communities. Um, and the fact that trauma-informed practice means that the men and women who serve can do an even better job. If there's a way that we can, through our day-to-day -day practice, um, you know, foster a, a culture and, and, and be able to work with people with where they're at and ensure that we're serving them in a way that not only benefits them, but can also benefit our system, uh, then I think it's a win-win. And again, you know, I... Honestly, Mr. Chair, I will be shocked if the government doesn't accept this. This is a guiding principle. We're not, we're not asking them to make sweeping changes to the bill. There are already one, two, three, four, four guiding principles. So this is adding one more. But if there's one thing I've learned in this place, Mr. Chair, is that it is important uh, words written on the page that that things like guiding principles uh, matter and should be in legislation. They should be codified because 
entities like our police services province-wide look to the legislation of what's in there. This could um, result in enhanced and augmented training. This could uh, better inform uh, the men and women who serve our province on how they interact and deal with Albertans. This can help them do a better job. And Mr. Chair, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of continuous learning and of professional development. I think everyone in every position should have opportunities to grow and to improve. And I think a rising tide lifts all boats. And so when individuals are given those opportunities, they're going to do better in their job. And it doesn't matter if they move to a different job. They're improving their whole workplace no matter where they move. And so this amendment um, helps them do that. You know, I can talk a, a little bit more broadly about the fact that, that one of the things I appreciate in this bill is the acknowledgement and recognition of civilian oversight and the role of civilians in participating. Because I think that's important. I can go back to my example of why Northeast Division for Edmonton Police are so effective. Do you want to know why, Mr. Chair? because of the relationships that they build in the community. I did a ride along with two outstanding officers. This was probably a couple of years ago now. And I was so impressed with the relationships they had built with members of the community. And I mean all members. I mean even people who um, have been in and out of incarceration still have good relationships with EPS and help inform them so that they can do a better job. But the role of Albertans and civilians is critical, and we see that all the time, of how police services rely on the relationships they have with Albertans, because they can't be everywhere. And so a bill that enhances uh, civilian oversight and participation is positive. It's positive uh, for this bill, and I think it's positive for, uh, for our, our, our police. And I honestly believe, Mr. Chair, that if we had the ability, and we don't because of time, to survey the men and women who serve, whether or not they would like to see this guiding principle included in the legislation, I'm confident that there'd be an overwhelming majority who would say yes. 100%. And if we had time to go out and survey them, then we would. But for Albertans watching at home, I mean, the bill was tabled a week ago. We're in committee of the whole. Uh, it'll likely pass out of committee uh, sometime today. And this week, next week, pass out of third and so there just isn't time for that but the relationships that I have with our police whether it's EPS the Calgary Police Service the RCMP or others they're looking for these types of signals that will enable them to sign up for more training and so there is no downside to including this in the legislation. So this is where I don't understand when members get up and say, no, we don't need this. Where most of them are already doing this. Okay, well, that's fantastic if they are. That's great. But then let's codify it in legislation. Mr. Chair, I've, I've told the story in this place of probably the most disappointing day of mine as a member of the Legislative Assembly in my 10 plus years in this place. And it was back in my first term between 2012 and 2015 when I was part of the four person fourth party and we tabled an amendment to enhance a bill. And members of government, the cabinet, stood up and said this is a very reasonable amendment. 
this, this makes sense. We see no reason why we can't do it, but they still voted against it. And we divided. And during the division, I went across and I spoke to members of executive council and said, if you stood up and said that the amendment was reasonable, why are you not accepting it? And the answer, Mr. Chair, was because it came from the NDP. I can tell you that that answer is what disgusts Albertans. They don't want to see partisan politics get in the way of good ideas. And you know what the reality, Mr. Chair? Good ideas come from all sides of the chamber. Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. And anybody who thinks they do, that's dangerous. And they won't put forward good ideas. The best CEOs surround themselves with really, really smart people who help them make those great decisions and come up with those great ideas. And so that day I will never forget, Mr. Chair. Was I there? You were in the chamber. Okay. The member for Edmonton Northwest was in the chamber. I served with him, member from Edmonton Strathcona, and the former member of Edmonton Highlands Norwood. <laughs> and that was really disappointing. And that's why, you know, Mr. Chair, I, I will give credit where credit is due and always have. And so when I've been in opposition and, and the government has accepted amendments, I will give them kudos. I will give them, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the appreciation uh, that they deserve. When we were government, and I was Minister of Economic Development and Trade, I adopted a number of amendments from the opposition. If they are good and they're going to strengthen or enhance a bill, then why wouldn't I? It is the most ridiculous answer in the world to not accept an amendment because of the party or the person who's moving it. Ridiculous. Albertans want to see good policy. Every time I talk to a business owner, whether it's a, a sole proprietor, a, a small business owner, or, or an executive from a multinational, they just want to see good policy. And, and frankly, Mr. Chair, that's part of the success of the Westminster system. We have a multi-party system to be able to share ideas, to come up with the best solutions, the best approaches of tackling problems. So I'm of the position that let's encourage that. Let's, let's adopt that. At every opportunity, let's accept good amendments. And, and the answer to say that, that police are already doing this, great. So let's enshrine it in legislation. That's not a reason not to accept it. I've yet to hear a good reason for the government to not accept this amendment. This is augmenting the guiding principles. So... With that, Mr. Chair, I will urge the government to do the right thing, to accept this reasonable amendment, <laughs> let's strengthen this bill, and let's do what we came here to do, which was to bring forward the best possible legislation to serve our constituents and Albertans and make our province a better place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honourable Members. Others wishing to speak to Amendment A1? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton West Henday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honour to rise again just for uh, a few moments. Um, I have really appreciated the debate on, on Bill 6 and in particular this amendment this evening and want to thank, uh, well, all the members of the opposition for speaking to this and I'm sorry if I leave anyone out here in particular, but I, I want to give my thanks to the member from Edmonton Ellerslie as well as the member from Calgary, uh, Bular, McCall. I'm going to end up naming everyone here, so I'm, I'm going to stop. But uh, I really appreciate over my last seven, eight years and going on eight years uh, in this house, the uh, wisdom of, of those members as well as the member from Edmonton Castle Downs, 
Edmonton, Rutherford, okay, I think I've named most of them now. Um, but everyone on this side in their own respect, whether they're a social worker, whether they've um, dealt with these issues in other ways. Uh, and and I, I do just want to reinforce one more time the very important point that uh, many members on this side of the House has made. Uh, just recognizing this amendment, um, again, just adding in the guiding principles, and we see many guiding principles here, and they all seem very reasonable. I think they uh, strengthen this legislation. I think that they're uh, valuable to have included in this legislation. Uh, but I, I was disappointed, uh, to say the least, to hear government members say, well, uh, you know, our, 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 um, our police services already uh, do uh, things like consider intersectionality, anti-racism, and trauma-informed practice, so we don't think it's necessary to include it in this legislation. But then I would argue, Mr. Chair, uh, that and it, I would disagree with this point, but it seems that the government is arguing that none of these guiding principles need to be in here then, uh, if they already recognize the history and cultures of First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people in Alberta. I don't think that the government is arguing that they don't already do that, but they are including it in the guiding principles within this legislation because it is valuable to have it included and codified in legislation, as the previous member and, and many members of the opposition said before. Um, very quickly, Mr. Speaker, I think this is an incredibly important amendment. I think that it is a valuable addition to the guiding principles. I think that it's become very clear the importance of uh, considering intersectionality, of uh, whether we're talking about GBA plus um, uh, policies when we're considering any government policy, uh, and, and especially in cases of police uh, matters and the idea of anti-racism. The fact is, in this day and age, uh, Mr. Chair, we need to be more than uh, not racist. We need to take every opportunity we can to be anti-racist, to call out racism, and to uplift uh, communities who have traditionally been affected uh, by racism. It's not enough to simply let people, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 just live, I guess, uh, to uh, not call out racism, but we need to celebrate and recognize the importance of their contributions, uh, of a diversity of, of backgrounds, considering intersectionality, considering um, ethnicity, culture, and, and many other things. So with that, Mr. Speaker, look forward to uh, hearing more and uh, eventually voting on this. Uh, but I do appreciate the member from uh, Calgary, Bular McCall, for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. Others wishing to speak to the amendment? The Honourable Member from Edmonton Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my privilege, actually, and uh, my pleasure to rise in the House and have the opportunity to add my comments on this amendment, Amendment to Bill 6, Police Amendment Act 2022. Um, I understand that there is not much time for me to say on this as uh, um, there. And I also probably, I would say thank for the, um, uh, my colleague, thank you to my colleague that who put this uh, amendment uh, forward and uh, many of my other colleagues that, uh, who had their uh, important uh, comments and supported this amendment. Um, I don't know exactly how much time I would have, how far I wanted to go, but you know this is this issue is very close to my heart, and I've been very passionate about this. And I was looking for the opportunity um, in this house that I could just share my views and my learnings and uh, and uh, enrich the experience of this house that how. The both sides of the houses can come together and, and do better um, to address the issue of racism in this province and uh, uh, social equality and all those. Um, we have a history of racism in this country and uh, the history uh, is deep rooted in colonial rule. We all know that it goes back and, and uh, um, Canada was, I know, understand, not very unique. Um, I come from the very place that also was ruled by uh, British colonial rule for over 200 years 
But what had happened in Canada was probably one of the very rare place that uh, where the indigenous people of that land faced genocide and they were systematically attacked um, over over 100 years, 120 years, 125 years uh, during the residential schools, how their children and uh, were snatched from the families. And Canada probably is one of the rare places in the world where you will see the mass graves of those children are being recovered and, uh, you know, day to day. And Canada is the only place probably where we call um, the graduates or the people uh, from the school, the survivors, not the graduates, survivors, the term coined because of the history and brutality and the options and the choices of the lives, uh, lives existed for those very people. And uh, uh, we also know Canada is built by the immigrant immigrants and uh, immigrant communities have played a very important role in the development of Canada and this province. But um, unfortunately, every um, you know, immigrant or nationality did not uh, experience actually um, uh, same, same thing uh, as the majority of the immigrants coming from probably European countries. Uh, they were privileged to, you know, receive welcomes and support and, and settlement help, um, including in Alberta, but we see that happened in, from early 90s to uh, mid-20s. Uh, while Canada was openly accepting the immigrants from some part of the world, uh, mostly the white immigrants, and similarly, those immigrants from other places, they played critical role, a Chinese immigrant from late 18 to early 1900s played and worked hard to build the Canadian railways, but they were rewarded with the Chinese head tax in 1920s. So one of the worst things that could happen to them in Canada. And similarly, uh, Indians, uh, United India, including India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, many countries. Um, the immigrants from India, as a British subject, they were under British rule. Um, they served the First World War for British, British, they served the Second World War for the British, but they had very different experience um, coming to here. Um, Coming to Canada, what the experience was that uh, in restaurants, in stores, uh, in public places that Indians and dogs are not welcomed. This is what they face. This is from their plight and fight against racism started. Not only this, in 1908, the right to vote from Indians was taken back, snatched. And that they have to fight for another 40 years until 1947, once they got it back. So there's a lot to talk about this. The, um, we know that the racism is not any government's policy in this country or any of the province. And uh, we also know many of those colonial pra practices do still exist, not only in Canada, and as definitely the overt things uh, the people like me who come from different parts of the world can see what is happening. But uh, even many of those countries where British ruled, those practices still exist the way it was. Um, so one of this, but in the bell we are discussing um, the Police Amendment Act. Um, it's very important. We have discussed this in this house many times. Um, as a multiculturalism critic, I had the opportunity um, with the consultation of Albertans, the consultation we had for almost 10 months in this province. Uh, uh, that was one of the main, actually, uh, feedback that we got back. 
uh, addressing the issue with the uh, police force, law enforcement. Uh, this was one of the biggest demand that, you know, um, the police force, law enforcement's force uh, comes in a way of substitute of, uh, in many cases, to the immigrant, particularly, or the racialized communities, as a substitute to the sport for mental health, a substitute to the uh, trauma-informed situations. Uh, we have seen the recent case, what happened in Calgary of Let Your Tool, that the, the very gentleman, hardworking individual, how he fell through the cracks and uh, ended up in, you know, the police, yeah, I would not call this encounter that he was killed. Um, a number of those issues, and, and I know the UCP members, the, the family came all the way from Calgary to speak with someone from the, um, the government, but uh, no one was available. I had the opportunity to come out and listen to them and even receive the memorandum, not only for us, also <coughs> for the government members. So this issue is very critical. What we are asking is bare minimum. That is one of the demand. There's a number of those things we can do it, but adding intersectionality just as a guiding principle, I think this is just a, just a symbolic change. There's a lot more to do. If we don't seem to see that uh, we cannot even you know, come up to support this bare minimum thing, then this is a demonstration of that we have a long way to go. Our legislatures themselves need to learn a lot about our own society, what is happening. Because what happened hundreds of years ago, uh, probably not in the same way. We will see that, is, that practices still exist. We will see the disproportionality of those communities when it comes to law enforcement. So we need to start it from somewhere, and this is a bare minimum and very good proposal. Uh, I would call this friendly amendment that my colleague has actually proposed. I would really like to see uh, support coming from the government house members. They had a chance. Uh, I brought forward a motion not long ago when uh, government announced the Police Act review that uh, the anti-racism panel should be uh, formed to go out, speak with racialized community and minorities, indigenous leaders, indigenous community, and come back and uh, set up their report. But that was defeated. Now we have a chance to do it. I would really appreciate, I would like to see this, the government house members supporting this. And with that, I conclude my remarks, uh, Mr. Chair. And I will be happy to see that all the mem members of this house will uh, supporting this uh, amendment. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, honorable member. Others wishing to speak to amendment A1? Seeing none, prepared to call the question on amendment A1 proposed by the honorable member for Calgary Buller Bacall. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. My opinion, the no's have it. And a division has been called. Call in the members.
members, a division has been called on Amendment A1 as proposed by the Honourable Member from Calgary, Buller McCall. All those in favour of the amendment, please rise. Honourable Mr. Sabir, Ms. Goring, Honourable Mr. Egan, Member Loyola, Member Carson, Mr. Diol, Honourable Mr. Billis, Honourable Mr. Fian. All those opposed, please rise. Honourable Mr. Shandro, Honourable Mr. Copping, Honourable Mr. Lowen, Honourable Mr. Guthrie, Honourable Mr. Dreeshan, Honourable Mr. Newdorf, Honourable Mr. Madhu, Honourable Mrs. Sani, Honourable Mr. Wilson, Honourable Mr. Milliken, Honourable Mr. Jeremy Nixon, Honourable Mr. Luan, Honourable Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, Honourable Mr. Amory, Mr. Yao, Mr. Godfrey, Honourable Ms. Isaac, Honourable Ms. Fur, Honourable Ms. Pond, Honourable Mrs. Allard, Mr. Sigurdsson, Honourable Mr. Yassin, Mr. Rosewell, Honourable Mr. Jason Nixon. Mr. Rain, Honourable Mr. Orr, Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, for the amendment 8 against 28. Members, that motion is defeated. We are now back on to the main bill. I see the Honourable Member from Calgary, Bueller McCall, has risen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I also rise to now move another amendment. And I can read that into the record while it's being distributed. MLA from Calgary McCall to move the Bill 6 Police Amendment Act 2022 be amended as follows. In Section 28, in the proposed Section 42.2, by adding the following immediately after Subsection 9. 10. For greater certainty, a complaint may be filed with respect to a former police officer under this section if, at the time the subject matter of the complaint occurred, the former police officer was a police officer. In Subsection 29, in the proposed section 43, by adding the following immediately after section 9. For greater certainty, the chief executive officer of the Police Review Commission may not dismiss a complaint under this section with respect to a former police officer if at the time of the subject matter of the complaint occurred, the former police officer was a police officer and there is no other basis for dismissing the complaint. Basically, this amendment be known as Amendment A2. Thank you. Basically, this amendment protects the jurisdiction of police commission for review of conduct of the police officer for conduct while employed as a police officer. This aligns uh, the professional conduct review of police officer in line with the medical profession. This ensures that an individual cannot avoid justice by quitting, being fired, or moving to a different police force. It is important for accountability that the procedure is protected in alignment with other regulated professional uh, professions and bodies. And with that, I urge all members of this House to support this amendment. Thank you, Honourable Members. Any others wishing to speak to Amendment A2? I see the Honourable Member from Edmonton for Edmonton Northwest. And, Honourable Member, oh, I no. hesitate oh. to interrupt. <laughs> But the time for debate this afternoon has concluded. The House stands adjourned until this evening at 7.30 p.m.